get started. Um, I will oh, just don't forget, those of us who have microphones, have the microphone pointed at you when you're talking. Um, and for applicants, any applicants, when it's your turn to come up, you're going to sit at the round in the middle, and whoever's speaking needs to speak into the microphone there. Any members of the public that are attending in person and want to make comments, you're going to want to go to the microphone right here on this end that's on this last table and use that microphone. Just stand there and talk and make sure that you say your full name um, and address when you first talk it there so that we have that for the record. Okay? Okay. Thank you. And we can review some of that too in the little section. Yeah. yeah. Just wanted to Everyone has a place to go. All right. I will call this meeting of the City of Montpelier Development Review Board to order. It is July 6th. My name is Kate McCarthy. I'm the chair of the DRB. Um, the first item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. Um, before we do that, I, I know that I, I want to check on something to make sure we have the order sent in, a, in a way that works well. Um, I know there are people here for the Elm Street application as well as the Liberty Street application. And is anyone here besides the applicant for the Northfield Street application? Okay. We just had, we just had a couple of people log in. Okay. Uh, Paige Girton from the Montpelier Conservation Commission. And oh, we have Mr. Walker again. So that was for Walker, yeah. Liberty Street. Okay. Okay. Thank all you. Right. Sorry. So if, if there's anyone, all right. Um, what we'd like to do is move it to the end of the agenda so we can accommodate some of the public who are here. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the, thanks Zach. Um, all right, so with that proposed modification to move the Northfield Street application to the end, is there a motion for the approval of the agenda? So moved. Motion by Kevin? Second. Second by Rob. I'm going to call the roll because we have someone on the phone. Um, Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. Rob? Yes. Abby? Yes. And I vote yes as well. We've approved the agenda. Thank you. Um, all right. So there's going to be now a staff review of the remote meeting procedures and process. As you can see, we are hybrid um, today. So we'll get some explanation of that. Okay, so I'm going to be sharing my screen, and this is mostly for people who are um, viewing from home, but, but uh, over, uh, Orca, uh, over Orca to look at the screen. Look at the screen. I've got a little I've information, information here that I'm going to read out for read everybody. Out for everybody. Um, um, hold on, hold I'm going to on, redo, I'm gonna it. redo it. All right. All right. So, so um, for, anybody for anybody viewing this, viewing meeting, this meeting via Orca Media, via Orca Media you, can you can participate in the board, in meeting, the board meeting via the Zoom via platform, the Zoom platform, using, platform this link using this here, link here. Um, or um, you can or call, you can into, call the meeting, into the meeting at 929-205-0699 with this meeting ID. If you're trying to log in and it's not working, you can email me. Email me. And then... Yeah, email yeah. me and I'll email do my best, to help, my best to help you. Um, for um, those for attending, those via, attending Zoom, via Zoom, turning, your, turning video on your video on is optional. Um, for um, everyone, for everyone attending, attending who has a microphone that can be muted, please make sure please you make do mute it when you're not speaking. You're not this speaking. reduces background, this reduces background, background noise, noise and feedback. If you're um, calling in on the phone, phone star six to mute and unmute. Um, for those um, on, for those via, on Zoom, via Zoom, use the chat use function, the chat only, function for only for troubleshooting, troubleshooting or logistics or questions. questions. Um, any um, questions, any or questions or you have about you have on, the agenda, on the agenda, you'll need to raise, raise your hand, hand. Either, either physically, either physically, if you're on the video, you're on the video, raise your hand button on your toolbar. On your toolbar. Um, if you're on the phone, you can press star nine, and this will do a little raise hand for us here via Zoom. You can also, if none of that is working, feel free to unmute, state your name in a quiet place, and let us know that you would like to speak, and the chair will recognize you. At the, you at the appropriate time. Um, for, um, anyone for anyone here, here who, is who is commenting, commenting on, an application, on an application, um, please make sure to provide, sure your, to provide full your full name and address, address for the record, for the when, record you when you speak. first speak. And we ask and we that, ask that any, any set of comments, set of comments um, be kept um, to an initial, kept to an initial two, minutes. two minutes. The chair may grant, the chair may grant additional time for speakers or follow-up questions follow or comments. Or comments. Or comments. Um, um, in the event the public is unable to access this meeting because we have offered access via Zoom, we will have to continue it. Continue it to a time, into a time certain. Place certain. If I'm finding, if I'm there finding are people that there are emailing, people emailing, emailing, able to get in. Able to get in. Um, I will now, I will hand, now this hand this meeting, meeting back over, back to, the over chair. to the chair. Great. Thank you, Meredith. 
Um, so comments from the chair. Welcome back. This is our first in-person meeting since before um, the pandemic began. So thank you for being here, for taking time this evening to be here. And thanks in advance for any bearing with us that becomes necessary as we try to accommodate the Zoom platform as, as well as the folks here in person. Um, we decided as a group that being able to maintain some sort of Zoom or phone in access was actually a silver lining of the pandemic in terms of people's ability to participate. So this is something we are trying and we will continue as long as we can, um, as long as it works. So I also want to say that um, during the pandemic, during the Zoom hearings, we did all of our deliberations in a closed deliberative session for consideration. And as we resume in-person meetings, we're going to go back to what we did before. So I'll remind the board and members of the public what that is, which is that we can still vote to deliberate in executive session on those applications that seem like they would benefit from that type of deliberation. That would be in a closed session. And after that, the vote would be taken and the decision would be issued as soon as possible. So um, that is the practice we're returning to. Um, I mentioned that we're doing roll call um, of board members. And I also want to mention that um, just so that people know, people are welcome to wear masks or not wear masks here. Whatever is comfortable, we won't assume anything one way or another um, about your choice. So please make yourself comfortable in this room. Okay. I don't know where to look because I've been staring at a screen for 16 yeah, months no, now. <laughs> How do I make eye contact? That is the truth. So bear, bear with us. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's a little hard to hear you all. Okay. Okay. That's a good question. Thanks for piping up. Um, let's let's turn off the AC for a bit and see how it goes. Or at least, is it on low already? I don't think we want it off, off for too long. Okay, so turn the fan on low. On the mic. No, this is, yeah. we turned off, we oh. turned off the speaker in this room because it was inter, it was causing an echo mm -hmm. with these speakers, which is how we hear the people on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So let's see if this helps. Okay. okay. And um, we'll also speak up. Yeah, we'll try to project. Give us a little ear sign um, if you need to. Thank you for letting us know. Great. All right. We're going to move on to item six on the agenda, which is approval of the minutes of May 17th and June 21st, 2021. Um, we do not have in attendance. Oh, we, we do, do have in attendance. Four. Okay. The people who were in attendance on May 17th who are el eligible to vote are Kevin, Rob, Abby, and Jean. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? First, uh, I, I would or ask. modification. Uh, Chair, th that if we would do the uh, individual member. Oh, thank you. Uh, out of practice. Yes, that's exactly so. <laughs> Jean, but, uh, Rob, but, Abby, who are all these people? Yeah. I'd like to introduce um, the other members of the Development Review Board, and I'll start with Kevin to my right. right. Kevin O'Connell. Thank you, Kevin. Jean Leon. Rob Goodwin. Meredith Crandall, staff. Great. And I've introduced myself as the chair. And then on the phone, we have Abby. Hi, uh, Abby White. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's go ahead. Um, and are there any modifications to the minutes of May 17th? Okay. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Motion by Jean? Second. Second by Kevin. I'll call the roll. Kevin? Yes. Rob? Yes. Abby? Yes. Jean? Yes. Great, thanks. We've approved the minutes of May 17th. And next we have the minutes of June 21st. These were um, paper handouts upon your arrival because um, the wrong minutes were included in the packet, which is all right. We've got the right ones now. Um, are there any corrections, or modifications to June 21st? Motion to approve. I have, I, have, I have one, a uh, fix, okay. sorry. Um, at the bottom of page two, it says, Rob mentioned that he doesn't feel like, feel there is not enough information available to decide tonight. Oh, I, think, I think the not should be crossed out because you were expressing that there was, there was not enough in. Got it. Yeah, double negative, yep, okay, cool. All Thank right, you. no problem. Um, 
Is there a motion to approve June 21st? So moved. Okay. Second. Great. I'll, I'll call the roll. Um, Rob? Yes. Abby? Kate, I wasn't in attendance June 21st. Oh, thank you. I had you down as in attendance. I was incorrect. All right. Um, so we, still have we do still have enough. So I'll start over with the vote. Sorry. Kevin? Yes. Rob? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I vote yes as well. We've approved the minutes of June 21st. Thank you. All right. So with that, we are going to move on to the, I feel like I'm yelling, but I'm just going to keep doing it. Is that all right? Okay. Um, turn the volume down at home. <laughs> um, the for first uh, item of business on our list is 14 Liberty Street. This is a continuation from last week or two weeks ago when we talked about this application, which is for the demolition of part of a historic structure. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is swear in anyone who may wish to speak on this who hasn't spoken already. Um, I'm going to swear everybody in and then go through it, yeah. Um, so is anyone here to be heard who wasn't before? Will, do you think you might speak on this one? I'm here to speak in favor. Okay, that's, that's allowed. Yeah, if you're going to provide evidence, we'll swear you in. Sure. Okay. I'm just looking and to see if there's anybody new. Oh, and I see Amanda, oh, Amanda Sawyer, Sawyer has her hand up. I was on the call yes. that I did not speak. That's okay. Are, are you, Judy, hi Judy, thank you. Um, I think we swore you in last time. Okay, so what I will do is I'll swear in Amanda and Will. Um, do you sw solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes. Very good. Thank you, Amanda and Will. All right, so um, what I'm going to do is let you know the order that we're going to follow in order to, to cover this. Um, we're going to receive an overview from Meredith and then an overview from the applicant. At that point, board members will be able to ask questions of the applicant. Then we'll hear from other parties or participants who want to speak, about two minutes each, and then the board will have a chance to ask those folks of any questions. After that, the board is going to turn to the staff report, specifically the outstanding issues, and go through those. Um, at that point, I will not be taking questions from other parties. Um, but the board may, may inquire of the applicant or other parties if, if board members choose. And then at the end, each person who's spoken will have two minutes to share concluding thoughts. Okay. So, um, yes, Allison, if you want to come up and sit in the, that chair has a microphone near it, so. Ah, you have your own computer. Do you need that to share stuff or? Okay. Yeah, so it's hot, hot mic, but not the hot seat. Yes. Great. Um, so yes, I'll have Meredith provide an overview of the status. Um, okay. And I'm going to try and keep yeah. looking. You're, you're watching the Zoom, so yep. if someone yeah. raises No, I've got hand. that. Yep, I've got okay. that up as well. I'll try not to be yeah. awkward. Yep. No. Nope. Okay. It's, it's it's a it's a new juggle. Looking for hands everywhere. Um, All right. So Meredith, thank you. Please provide us an overview of, of where we've been and and what is new today. Okay. So um, I'm going to keep this fairly brief. In general, um, the, this is a continuation of an application um, requesting board approval to demolish a shed that's part of a structure that's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and the application is also for approval of moving the larger historic barn to a different location on the same parcel. Um, that second aspect of this would normally have just been an administrative permit. Um, but because we have that historic demo involved, this came up to the board. Um, at the last hearing on June 21st, um, at the conclusion of that, the board asked for additional information regarding a clearer site plan, um, including details on setbacks, um, some stormwater information, and um, a quote for what it would cost to reconstruct the shed that's being proposed to be demolished, um, reconstruct or rehabilitate. Um, we had several, so we have comments from several neighbors at that point. Um, and at this point, I think that the, you know, we, we got some more information from the applicant, which is in the packet that everybody had access to. Um, and those are, those are really the, the outstanding things as far as I could tell. Clearer site plan, stormwater info, and what it would take to rehabilitate or reconstruct the shed. Okay. So those were the outstanding issues that as, as we came off the call last time, had to, having to do with stormwater, 
um, how the how the building was going to be reconstructed and the um, information for the test um, about whether it's okay to demolish something. So we received that information. Um, Great. So I'll turn to you and give you a chance to tell us um, about the additional information um, and anything else you want to present to help us answer those outstanding questions. original historic structure. Um, it was something built after the fact, and it's in very poor condition, and it would be expensive to pretty much, you would have to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. um, the estimate from Will came in around $50,000, and that is in addition to moving the barn and putting it on a foundation. Great. Thank you. Um, and did you, another outstanding question had to do with the stormwater. Um, do you want to talk about any additional plans? Yes. Um, excuse, excuse me. I am having trouble hearing the applicant. I did not understand what she said in her prior presentation. Okay. Thanks. Maybe what, what we'll um, have you do is get that a little closer to your mouth, even though it's a little awkward. Um, sure. We don't speak into microphones every day, but um, right. thanks for chiming in to make sure that everybody can be heard. Um, great. So if you just want to reiterate um, the, the cost of the rehab estimate and then um, speak to the stormwater sure. issue. The estimate to restore the shed would be about $50,000. Um, it's in tough shape, and it wasn't part of the original historic building. Okay. Okay. Great. And for the stormwater, I engaged in a conversation with Don Marsh, who's a civil engineer. Um, he came over and looked at the site, um, spoke to Jason Merrill, who will be the contractor. You need to speak up, and there's other people who can hear you. Okay, excavating um, the site. And he also spoke with Kurt at the Montpelier DPW and put together a plan that would involve gravel around the site um, to absorb the water and prevent migration to any of the adjacent yards. Okay. Okay. Um, and is, is Amanda here to speak from on the engineering piece? Um, She's I, I here as an uh, consultant on architecture. An architecture consultant. Okay. Historic preservation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I couldn't remember who Amanda was with. Yeah. Um, thank thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Okay. So, um, is there any anyone else with the applicant, such as Will, who would like to add, if that's all right with you? Okay. And just go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and. Uh, you're Will to sit, sit down if you too. <laughs> Well, we may have that eventually. It's just okay. what we're working with right now. Um, Will Shabaum, um, Threshold Building and Design, formerly Steeplechase Design and Build, and uh, I live 217 North Street. Um, quick history, I have fairly intimate knowledge of the structure in its current state, having done a project for Allison in the past. Um, both the current carriage barn and the shed have no foundation. I mean, just like grade beams, totally rotten away. It's... Yeah. So in terms of, I guess, the first point being is the the, the renovation of the shed. is It's one of those chicken or the egg things first. To, to do it properly, you sort of need to do the barn properly. But to do the barn properly, you have to have the shed done properly. And so it's, um, you know, my professional perspective of that shed is that it was something that was very poorly cobbled on after the fact and is not an original um, part of the carriage barn. So, and just, you know, it's, it, as I said, it's, it'd be very complicated to sort of restore it without having to restore the first 
barn first, which is in a poor location. And um, anyways, and then I guess the second point being the stormwater is that you know I think obviously with new construction, you know where we would be minimizing the impervious surface by removing the shed, um, and then being able to sort of control any of the the roof water that comes off um, in terms of site plan orientation stuff with, you know, as Allison was mentioning, the gravel, you know, all the foundation would be backfilled with crushed gravel and sand, um, you know, sloped appropriately. And then, you know, there's obviously opportunities for, you know, whether it's, you know, a rain garden, um, you know, obviously gutters. The current building doesn't have gutters on it, does it? So, yeah, it's just landing. Um, so there'd be a lot more sort of intentional and uh, smart planning uh, infrastructure put into place with the the new location and the you know the proper um, you know once it's all leveled and on a new foundation. Okay. So I think those are my my points that I want to bring up is that you know I don't see any historical value in the shed. Um, you know the carriage barn, of course, if it's you know it has a lot of potential to be you know a great you know another hundred years ahead of it mm -hmm. or more. And then I think the water is. A very easily manageable issue. Okay. So, so um, did I hear correctly that gutters will be put on the carriage barn, whereas they are not on there today? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be. I mean, I think you know, it's good, good design, no matter what, because that way you can control where it would go. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, like you know, the north slope. You know, the, the proposed site. You know, there's obviously the the axis is primarily east-west, a little bit off of that. So, um, you know, any of the water that's shedding to the, um, I forget the exact parcel on Loomis Street, you know, could, could be, you know, directed to the front of the building, you know, whether there's a rain garden that's integrated with the, you mm -hmm. know, crushed gravel backfill and whatnot, you know, mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of opportunities to make it so that it's not going to impact anybody's property, and it's essentially flat, okay. so. So when you say front of the building, is that the part of the building that uh, faces the driveway, not the part of the building that faces 18 Liberty? Yeah, I mean, I guess when I look at it, you know, the ridge is going, is pointing to 18 Liberty, and mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't have the site plan in front of me, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right, so. so next what we'll do is um, we'll give board members a chance to ask questions based on what new information we have heard. Um, I'm sorry, can I oh, just. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just to be clear that it's. That one parcel that we're talking about when we say 26 Liberty, mm -hmm. that parcel, oh, there's a Loomis. combination of 24 and 26. Okay. And 24 is the house that's right nearby, but yes, that property boundary mm -hmm. is really for both 24 and 26. Okay. Just as a point on the record. Okay. Thanks. Questions from board members? together remember when we were out here but mm. oh make sure you're right near the microphone because they were having problems seems like we're talking about kind of two stages separate things here one of the things we are i think the information provided on financial budget was definitely helpful organized but so we're talking about the removal of the shed and then the moving of the of, of the carriage barn which are how, how are those two connected could you summarize how how those are <laughs> Sure. Related to each other. Sure. Um, in order to restore the barn, well, I guess my application here is um, because the, the shed was mentioned on the historic register, I have to come to the DRB to get approval to remove it. I mean, that's really the first step. Mm -hmm. And the um, next step will be to move the barn um, onto a permanent foundation. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know what we're making a decision on. on the shed. Uh, okay. Procedurally, if yeah. that's the issue? Yes. Yeah. This is all one application. It's all one project, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why the whole thing is here. If all I sent to you was the thing that the DRB had to make their decision on, mm -hmm. all that would be here was, can the shed be demolished? But the whole we, we forward the whole application when it comes to the board because sometimes there's context, which there is here in that the 
part of the process of moving the barn includes you have to do something with the shed, whether it's move it with the barn because they're attached or take it off, right? right. So the, the, the stormwater stuff that we've been discussing is all related to the administrative approval part under Chapter 300 about yeah. does moving the barn comply with the stormwater regs? I guess maybe the, to clarify the question, does, does moving the barn itself, the shed didn't exist, trigger any historical no. issues? No. Okay. No. There's, there's, if, nope. if, if all, if the shed did not exist, if nothing were being demolished, yeah. if the shed were in great shape and they were going to move the barn and the shed together, this would never have been here because we wouldn't have triggered the demolition provision at all. It would have just been moving it and it would have just been an administrative permit. Mm -hmm. And so in theory, if the shed was, was approved and the, uh, plan was then to move both of them together, it would be, cease being an issue for us. Potential. It, 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 yeah, but that's just... Uh, I mean, sorry, it's hypothetical. That's hypothetical. That's hypothetical. Yeah, looking not, for, the, con, for, for context. Yeah. yeah. If, if the shed didn't exist in the first place and this barn was being moved, it would not would be before us for its initial plate. review. Right. Correct. Right. Though, um, now that it is before us, it's our... Um, it's our responsibility to look at the whole of it because there is a context here. Those, in order for the full permit to be granted. One vote, correct, for, for the two Yeah, it's one vote on the project, for, okay. unless there's some preliminary votes that happen on, on preliminary matters. Um, Brooke, your hand on Zoom is still up. I don't know if you have a question still or not. So. What a, I, I'm just, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm, in the message. Okay, she just maybe took it down. I, okay. I did that already before and then it was okay. up. Um, <laughs> Thank so you, Brooke. That's good, good clarifications. Um, what I'll do is take additional questions from board members for, on, on what we've just heard, and then um, two minutes each from other parties and participants, and then we'll go through the criteria. Okay? So anything else from the board? I'll give you a sec to think. No further no, questions. questions were answered. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. All right. So we'll do two minutes each from other parties and participants. I'm going to use the, the bell. Um, and I would, I'm going to um, go in the following order. Um, Stephen and Judy, Brooke, Amanda, or Stephen and Judy, Stephen, Judy, Brooke, Courtney, Amanda, and we have Kevin. We have two Amandas. It's Kevin, right? All right, great. We have two Amandas. Right. So we have Amanda on Zoom and we have Amanda and Kevin here. Oh, Amanda Sawyer. Okay. <laughs> so what we'll do is next we'll do, um, because the, the order of our procedure is people who are in support of a project and people who have concerns of a project, roughly speaking. So that, that's what I'm going to do. So, okay, with scratch that. Um, we'll, we will go next with Amanda, Stephen, and Judy. And then after that, we'll, okay? Amanda Sawyer. Amanda Sawyer. <laughs> so, um, Amanda Sawyer, uh, if you'd like to unmute and speak, we, we'll give you two minutes to do so. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, I am Allison, consulting architect for the project. I'm a registered architect. I am LEED certified. Um, I serve on my local historic district uh, for, for several years. And on a professional level, I have extensive experience with historic structures. So, I just wanted to touch on the existing shed and its condition, um, and in my professional opinion, that, that appendage that was tacked on to the existing um, barn is, is not historical, is not historic, it should be removed. Um, it, was, it was haphazardly and poorly constructed. It really holds no historic value. I'm sure you've, you've seen the photos of it. Um, even if it was to be restored per se, um, nothing of the original structure, cladding, windows, nothing original would, would even exist. It would really be just rebuilt. Um, so, you know, my, my goal here is just to, um, you know, help the board understand just architecturally um, how it relates to to the barn and and how it's really not, in my opinion, um, worth worth restoring or saving in any any way. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, all right. Um, next, 
Um, I'll turn to Judy, since she's right in front of me. And if you'd please come up to this microphone here. Um, at, at this point, we, we've heard from folks um, in our, everything from our previous meeting is still on the record. So um, comments that respond to the new information are the most helpful. And I'll start the two minutes. So please identify yourself and then go ahead. I'm Judy Walk. I live at 12 Liberty Street across the driveway from Allison's house and barn. Um, we've lived there since 1973, so nearly 50 years. And I just want to speak to how good a neighbor Allison has been in terms of communications about anything having to do with changes that any of us were making you know, we had the driveway fixed a while ago, and we always, and she has, has been exemplary in how she has reached out to neighbors and asked for their input and made sure that nothing was done by surprise. And so that's my only testimony. The rest of it, we can leave it to the engineers and the architects. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Judy. All right. And um, I know that Stephen is also here on the phone. Would you like to speak as well? Uh, I'm on Zoom, thank you. Uh, oh, yep. I'd like to speak to the runoff issue. As Judy mentioned, four or five years ago, we had the back part of the driveway dug up and replaced with um, gravel and all that. Before that happened, we would have monster pools of water um, on the downside of the shed over the entire back part of the driveway. And since then, we have had no water problems whatsoever. There's no buildup of water under the shed roof. There is no pooling of water anywhere else. It all goes down into the ground. And I think that's what will happen when the, bar, when the barn is moved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, very good. All right. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, turn to some other folks who are here to be heard. And um, I, I want to know who's interested in going first. Um, I don't want to assume that just because someone has representation that they want their representative to speak first versus, versus otherwise. So maybe I could look around the room and the Zoom and see who would, should, if Brooke should go first or, um, yeah, okay. Um, so Brooke, please go ahead. I will start the timer and um, go right ahead. Uh -oh, a timer. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is focus on the fact that there still has been no evidence presented upon which this board could make a determination that either the um, either of the criteria that are required to be proven uh, by the applicant. Neither of those have been satisfied. Oh, tonight we've heard from an architect and uh, I'm not sure the other fellow's credentials um, that in their opinion, they don't think it's of any consequence of historic building is not a historic building. Well, guess what? It's on the registry. So if they want to make, make that argument, then I suggest that the applicant uh, apply to have her building removed from the historic registry or wait for a change in the zoning ordinance because the very clear plain language of the ordinance requires that there be that section 3001 uh, 3004 regarding demolition be satisfied. These are mandatory requirements. The DRB does not have liberty to uh, impose any discretion. Um, there's one of two things that has to be proven, that there, that the uh, not allowing the um, demolition would cause undue financial hardship to the owner, or that the demolition is part of a site plan development that would prove clear and substantial benefit to the municipality. Those factors have not been proven. There are pages of information, evidence that they can be provided and considered by the board. None of that information has been provided, and the information on those lists that has been provided argues in favor of the fact that this is not an undue uh, financial burden at all. In fact, the page 22 of the appraisal report, or of that packet, page 22 is the appraisal report, 
that the applicant provided saying I can't get a conventional loan, but I can get a different kind of loan. That very document indicates that the there is no problem. This shed does not create any uh, difficulty for the property. Uh, it says, quote, Okay, I, oh, we, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Brooke, I'm going to interrupt you, but I noticed, uh, I think you're reading from page 22 of the appraisal, which you're citing as evidence um, about about loans um, that are available. Um, and, and oh, I, I beg your pardon, the appraisal report. Yes. A, appraisal report, that's what I meant to say. Um, so that's okay. Um, so I do need to, if you want to just conclude your thought, then we can, we can move on. Well, it, I have a couple other things to say, so okay. Okay. I'll, I'll try to move, move very quickly. But that page one of six, which is page 22 of the exhibit provided by the yeah, asks if there are any physical defi deficiencies or adverse con conditions that affect the livability, soundness, or structural integrity of the property, and the answer was no. And then it says no repairs are needed to the home, which has been extensively remodeled. So I think that that's very important because that shed in no way diminishes or causes any structural problem in terms of an appraisal of the property, and she is able to get finance. <clears throat> the other issue that I want to point out to the board is that in the testimony last time, the applicant was asked about, did you know that this was historic when you first purchased it? And she said no, she didn't know about that. But she was also asked uh, whether the shed, what the shed's condition was when she purchased the property, and she said it was not in bad shape. So the biggest concern that I have is that the very last section of um, this section on demolition discusses the conditions to be excluded from review. And it says, demonstration of undue financial hardship by the owner shall not be based on conditions caused by or resulting from the following, and then there's A through G that's listed. And C says failure to perform normal maintenance and repairs. The testimony of the applicant was it was not in bad shape when she took title to it. She has done nothing and allowed it to deteriorate. It has not been repaired or maintained, hence it is now, uh, as you have heard from her own architect, falling down, it's no longer sound. Um, this is not what the city should be doing. The plain language of the ordinance prohibits you to consider that somebody allowed their uh, property to be uh, destroyed over time to be um, not tended to. Okay. You have an obligation to do that and cannot use it as an actual excuse. Okay. Thank you, Brooke. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there because it's it's now been about four minutes. Um, I, I thank you, thank you for, for your comments, and I'd like to move on to some of the other interested parties in the interest of getting everybody to have a chance to speak. So, um, Amanda or Kevin, or both? Sure. Yeah, you can have a seat there. Identify your, your, yourself with My your name's name. Kevin Coughlin. I live at 18 Liberty Street. Um, how's it going? I don't think we met yet. I have... You know, no background in architectural work or anything. All I can speak for as, you know, a, you know, husband and father and owner of our, our house is how I personally feel. And I have to say, I love that, you know, your effort to restore and to maintain a historical structure, I think is noble and a good idea. And I'm all about it. Um, speaking as your neighbor personally, I think that I am very concerned as having a house that's actually older than the structure that we're considering. And contextually, we're, although we're debating over a shed, we're really talking about the structure being moved at the end of the day. It's now become one issue. Mm -hmm. And my concern personally is that the biggest thing for me is storm water. Our house was built in 1870. It has a dry stone laid foundation. We have two sump pumps going. And I don't think that a gutter system is necessarily, with the type of rain we get here, sufficient enough for me to feel like I would be OK with that. Also, the idea that there's going to be a barn that blocks more than half our windows that's higher than our house, that's not as old as our house, that I don't know whether or not it's on a registry, but historically, it's more historic based on time. 
Um, I am concerned about the degradation that could occur if that was to be moved, especially because it was listed as being in a flood zone where you want to move it to. Um, beyond that, I, I, would, like, I would be almost willing to help you with getting the shed removed, but I can't stand behind, no matter whether it's a historical structure or not, watching tens of thousands of dollars of my own property investment wash away into my dry stone laid foundation because you want to save a barn that you're not even using. I mean, I'm raising a family in my house. Okay. And I'm sorry, there's a certain part of me that's like, I can't stand up for that. I'm sorry. Okay. And I respect you thoroughly for what you're trying to do. And I don't want to like be a jerk about it, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's the right thing to do. Okay. And anything that we could do to help to get the shed removed, if that's the problem area, we would love to help. I would personally work to do it. So that's all I can have to offer. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for taking the time to be here. No problem. Um, Amanda, do you want to step up as well, or? Is occupied? <laughs> yeah, set. Okay. Sleeping baby. Sleeping baby. Oh my gosh. Um, thank you. Um, what we're going to do next is give. Oh. Um, at this point, we will give board members a chance to ask questions of the folks who just spoke. But Meredith. I didn't know if you were going to let Courtney talk. There she is. Courtney, I apologize. Thank you. I, I, my, the eyes, my eyes in the back of my head are not working very well. So yes, please. The back of my head are not working very well. So yes. No worries. We're all adjusting to life post-COVID. Or it stays that way. And I apologize for any um, technical problems because I'm dialing in from my daughter's good. office in New York. You're good. Okay, great. Um, I will basically say, as you already know, I have broader concerns about the plan generally, very serious concerns about what this would do to the historic nature of all the properties involved, including 24 and 18 Liberty. Um, uh, and those concerns and arise on the municipal, state, and federal and legislation you know about historic properties. Gain, and you know I have concerns about solar gain, about air flow, about, about all sorts of things that I know the municipality of Montana is very concerned about and which um, show up in all relevant legislation. However, right now I know we're talking about the shed, so I need to find out the answer to the requirements um, under 304D1B. Um, I would like to understand, I would like to, understand, um, I would like to see the evidence that this is, um, that this is an undue financial hardship, that rehabilitation would be an undue financial hardship to the owner. And if it isn't, um, and then you have to consider whether or not the development plan would provide a clear and substantial benefit to the municipality, I would reserve the remainder of my time to pop back in. That. But um, all I would add or um, go on is I know that we don't necessarily, you all don't necessarily have lawyers on your panel and board, but I do know that you're operating under that legal framework. And that I, I know that undue financial hardship is quite a high bar to clear. So I'm very curious to see the evidence that would clear undue. Under law financial for this property and for under this law thank you for so this much. property and perfect for this thank, plan. thank you thank Courtney. you so much um all right so at this point it's the board's turn to ask questions of wh about what they have heard if they have any i have no further no questions Jean? Well, i'll give you a moment yeah just one second This is Abby. I have a, I have a question, a question perhaps, perhaps for Meredith, Meredith or for, for you. you. Sure, and go I'm ahead. Curious I'm, curious if, if, I'm curious if you, if you could shed, shed some additional light on how, how we define, define um, undue uh, financial, financial hardship, hardship or if or that is, is a, a um, more of a more subjective, of a subjective term, term that we know that we do have discussion around. So I'd like to on that from you. 
We, we do have an attorney sitting on this near well, the, near this panel, so um, <laughs> okay. I will, I will okay. put her on the spot. I, 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 thank, thank. License yeah, is thank inactive, you. so I'm not giving legal advice as an attorney. I'm giving advice as the zoning administrator and staff. Thank you for clarifying yeah, after yeah. I put you on the spot like that. Um, so, um, you know, with regard to undue financial hardship, we follow the regulations, right? And we're, we're not looking for some other legal term for undue financial hardship, um, right? So there is a standard in the regulations for determining undue financial hardship, right? Which is in 304D sub three. These are the standards, the, the different items to consider, right? It says the DRB shall consider the following factors. And there's a list of them a through H, okay? And there's a whole bunch of those. Those are all things that can be yeah. considered. Historically, over the last three years since these regulations went into effect, the board has not said that every single one of those things has to be found, right? You don't, you don't have to have every single one of those things. These are all things that are considered, right? Um, and then when we get to 304D4, it says that a statement of a, a determination of undue financial hardship may be granted only if the project fully complies with one of the following re requirements, right? There's the for income producing properties and non income producing <coughs> properties. So these are the, the big picture conclusions you have to reach after looking at all those standards. And I, I can't, I, if people want me to read all those standards, I can, but I, I think that's kind of a waste of time. Um, but so I'll do would, it if you need you, it. Would you provide the reference and page number? Or, would you please provide um, the reference and page number for those standards for um, anyone so, who wants so, to look? So the reference for the standards, I, I don't have a page number because unfortunately the one I have printed out doesn't oh, have page numbers. But I do. Okay. You do. Okay, so it's, it's page 3-9. To 3-9 through 3-11, and it's section 3004 d 3 a through h those are the standards those are all the different things to consider right so things like applicants knowledge of the properties uh can you move the mouse on there i can see still we're gonna pause oh, for a what? minute while we second. get the zoom people showing there we go yeah. it was the it was the that the projector, projector. sorry it's the projector going quiet okay cool um, you know, for examples of those standards, it's applicants' knowledge of the property's historical significance at the time of acquisition or of its status subsequent to acquisition, so you don't have to know about it when you buy it. Um, structural soundness of the building or any structures on the property and their suitability for rehabilitation. Current level of economic return on the property is one option to look at. Um, there, there's a whole bunch. So those are those, right? And then it... 3004D, 4, A and B, there are the um, de you know, requirements for determining undue financial hardship. There's one for income producing properties and one for non-income producing properties. I'm gonna read the one for income producing properties, although Allison, can you just confirm that at least part of the barn, or the, is the shed, the shed and the barn, so this is all about the shed. So we'd have to find out if the shed has ever been rented out, right? I mean, the barn, is the barn rented out sometimes? Put the, you can push the microphone back towards you. Part of the barn, do, do tenants use the barn for storage? The tenants use part of the barn for storage. So I think it's going to be up to the board to determine how they qualify the shed because the shed is the only thing that's going to be proposed to be demolished, right? Mm -hmm. So for income producing properties, the standard is that the building site or object cannot be feasibly used or rented at a reasonable rate of return in its present condition or if rehabilitated, right? So that it can be rented in a way to recover what it costs to rehabilitate it and denial of the application would deprive the owner of all reasonable use of the property. In this instance, I, I, I don't think, you know, I, I think that language is drafted, anyway, it says of the property. I, I'll stop there. 
For, for non-income producing properties, it says the building site or object has no beneficial use as a residential dwelling or for an institutional use in its present state or if rehabilitated. And denial of the application would deprive the owner of all reasonable use of the property. That's what it says. If people want to know what I think, then they can ask me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Abby, and that, um, that explanation, Meredith. Um, board members have some questions that they would like to ask based on what they've heard. Would, hi. Go ahead, Would Jean. the applicant, would you be considered, I mean, open to the consideration of, of just demolishing the shed and, and maybe rehabilitating the barn without relocating it? Or, or so I, I just want to briefly point out, we did discuss that at yes. last meeting, and it involves moving the barn twice off Correct. the foundation yeah. to build, or off the, off of its current location to build a foundation, then back on. I, I understand that, but, um, but oh, sorry. There's a, there could be just a consideration of just the demolition of the shed and leaving, you could rehabilitate the, the barn in place without having to move it, can you? Is it possible to rehabilitate the barn in place without moving it? No. No. I, I won't do it. Okay, it's, that, that's, uh, that's um, yeah, the Yeah, I really question. won't. It's within six inches of right. the next door neighbor. I, I it would be even more money to move it, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. A to B, B to C, mm -hmm. that whole thing. I won't do it. Okay. It's okay. too much money. Okay. And it doesn't make sense to put it back in that location six inches from the other building. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Um, Just make sure you're next to the microphone. For this entire project as a whole, um, are there any um, public funds or historical, uh, you know, grants or any of anything of that sort, helping you um, do this project? I this project I've been talking about for about 17 years, right? I hired. Will five years ago to do site plans to facilitate conversations with my neighbors to share that. I spoke with um, the previous owners of, of both of those houses um, for about 10 years about this project. And at it was about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I was worried about the safety of the building and I decided to tear it down, tear the whole thing down and build a garage, right? Within the zoning, which would have been you know allowed and I talked to Meredith and she said you know what you you can't just tear it down you have to come to the DRB and she gave me a little pep talk she told me I had to talk to a historic con preservationist and and I never wanted to take the barn down I wanted to try and figure out a practical way to save it I researched grants tax credits the whole thing there's nothing I can access. Um, and then I continued to work to get estimates. Um, and I talked with Judy and Steamer, who love the barn. And I don't know, I just am push, trying to push through. And mm -hmm. there's just, and here we are. But anyway, did I answer your question? No, you did. Just, it's one of our criteria. It's a, a G. Um, I think you answered no, there's it well, no, so. No, yeah. there's no funding. Well, it's, just, well, it's one of our things to consider, and that oh, was a good answer, so thank you. Okay. We're just getting, they're getting stuff on the record. Yeah, I understand. We're getting, yeah. Um, regarding the standards for determination, which are 3004D3, um, I'm just, we read these at the last meeting. I'm going to do it again. Um, I think it's important. Um, the applicant's knowledge of the pro, we need, when we're making a determination about whether this undue financial hardship exists, we consider the applicant's knowledge of the property's historical significance at the time of acquisition or since, the structural soundness of the building and suitability for rehabilitation, the economic feasibility of rehabilitation or reuse of the existing property in the case of a proposed demolition, or the current level of economic return on the property as considered in relation to a number of, of other things. Um, so I want to see if specifically board members have questions about th those. We, we have heard testimony previously. Um, there wasn't knowledge about historical significance when purchased. There is knowledge now. Um, we've received testimony as to the structural soundness of the building. Um, we've heard about the fe economic feasibility of rehabilitation or reuse of the existing property, um, a, a $50,000 
cost to rehabilitate estimated and the current level of economic return on the property. One of the things I've also heard you say is that it's not possible to maintain the barn um, and so to invest in your property with the shed present. Um, could, would you be willing to share the overall cost of the project so that we can understand the 50,000 shed demolition cost in or rehabilitation cost in relation to the overall project? I think this might help us understand the level of impact. Kate, uh, this is Brooke Dingledean. I'm going to object to that question because that is trying to elicit the information or evidence that the applicants failed to provide you. We don't, we don't exercise objections in this um, panel. Um, we operate in a quasi-judicial format that is meant to be as approachable as possible for applicants and other participants. Um, we would love if everybody had 110% of the information that we request, um, but that is not always possible. So as we seek information through questions and answers, which are part of our procedure, um, that is part of how we get evidence, even if it wasn't initially provided. So I'm going to continue with that question. Please go ahead, Allison. $70,000 for a foundation for site work uh, to move the barn, um, to do some landscaping, very basic mm -hmm. grass, and some carpentry. OK, thank you. So that helps us understand proportionally the, what the shed rehabilitation would be. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking for a minute and see if my fellow board members, including Abby, if you'd like to chime in. Uh, thank you, I, think I really appreciate really that, that question because it does, it does help, help to get the proportionality. I'm wondering if there's any additional guidance to provide or help us understand how to evaluate. Financial hardship. I feel like we, we look to the standards of the bylaw um, using the information that we have, and that's, that's, really, that's really the best that, that we can do as a board, and that's, that's our job as a board. Can I just make one comment, yeah. Kate? Yeah. I think that the one thing to keep in mind is that you know, this keeps saying the property, I think, in large part because a lot of the time this is considering, you know, the, the, most of the provision is considering tearing down a large building on a property, even though it says looking at part, you know, any part of a historic building. Um, you know, I, I, the focus should be on what is being demolished. As opposed to as the to, entire parcel uh, with all the things on it. Right. As it's opposed to, like, the economic return from the entire parcel. That is, okay. that is okay, what I mean. We're you. somewhere where it talks in here. Um, you know, there, there's bits in here about this. And I think that a lot of times when they're talking about the property, they mean the property being demolished, I think, in it, its poor drafting. And I think that's consistent with how we've done it before. Yeah. But Kevin has his right, hand up. Right, so I have my hand up. If you could get this close. To, Back to the mic. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe we've we've uh, exhaustively uh, uh, taken the uh, public testimony and, and discussed this amongst ourselves. And when the board is prepared, is ready, I uh, I will offer a motion to uh, uh, to close the public session and move to deliberative session for the decision uh, making part of this application. Great. Thank, thank you, Kevin. That is um, a good transition to the next part of our discussion, which is for board members to discuss further how the criteria yes. are met. Um, Jean, did you have something? No. Okay. I second that motion. It's not a motion yet. Not a motion yet. Yeah. Not a motion yet. Don't show your cards. I'm ready for a motion if you're ready, Kevin. I'm ready. Okay, so um, before we do that, I did also promise that everyone who's spoken has two minutes for concluding thoughts, and I want to follow that through. Um, it's going to be a firm two minutes. Um, and what I'm looking for at this point is new information. Um, and I will go in the same order as before, just for consistency's sake. So, um, Allison, anything to add? 
I guess the, the one thing I will add is, you know, I did reach out to my new neighbors this, um, this spring uh, when it looked like my project was going to move forward, and I left notes in their mailboxes because it was COVID, and I didn't want to knock on anyone's door, and, um, and I knew the properties were sold, and this is a big project with a big impact, and, um, you know, looking forward to to getting through to a decision and then having a conversation about the project um, okay. to hear their, hear their concerns. Great. Okay. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm just going to go in the same order. You can you can pass if you want. Um, Will, any new information to add? No information from Will. Okay. And Amanda on Zoom, any new information? Yeah, I, I wanted, to, I wanted add to add something, something um, um, for Kate made a comment, made a comment regarding, regarding something that something Allison, that Allison said, I believe, said, I believe in the last hearing where Allison, where Allison commented, commented that the, the, shed the shed was not, was in, not in such in bad shape. Bad shape. That's, 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 that's was really a, really a relative statement. statement. Allison, Allison is not an architect, architect. she's not an engineer. She's not an engineer. engineer. Um, um, I just want to, you know, put my two senses as a professional. That shed has been long gone for a long time. It is structurally, it is not sound, and it has not been sound for a very long time. So I just wanted to, you know, put that out there to the board so they understand. Allison did not let that shed go intentionally. That shed has been gone for a very, very long time. Before, before she bought the property. Bought the property. So, so I just wanted, I just to, wanted add to add that. that. So thank you, very, so thank you much. very much. Thank you, Amanda. I will second that. <laughs> will, has, will has seconded that. All right, so I'll continue in order. And so next would be Judy, if you have anything to add. I don't have anything new. OK. I just would urge you all thank to be you. practical about what we're really talking about here. That, that shed is not a credit to the city of Montpelier's historic heritage. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll repeat. Thank you. I'll repeat that into the microphone, which is a urging to be practical with this and the view that this shed is not of historic relevance to the city. Um, so please, please don't stumble on the details. I, is that okay? Nodding. Okay. And I will also turn to Stephen if there's anything um, new to add at this time. I can't gain say what my wife has said, so I'll be quiet. There you go. All right. Um, and so next, um, I will turn to you, Brooke, for, um, for two minutes of, of new information. Um, please go ahead. I want to talk about the law. You were a quasi-judicial board that is charged with implementing the law. And what I found out tonight is you don't even know what the law is. You have never read it. You are not familiar with the information that you are supposed to be gathering. No wonder that there isn't sufficient evidence presented to meet the applicant's burden of proof. You folks don't even know what that burden of proof is or what evidence that could be submitted. And I'm sorry if that sounds disrespectful, but this is astonishing to me. In 25 years of practice, I have never seen such a thing. Where the actual members making the decision came to two hearings completely unprepared to know what the law is and what they there are two things that need to be proven. You need to read all of this, all of section 3004, demolition, because it's lots of information. I don't even know whether this is an income producing property or not. It is, you need to know what the law is before you hold the hearing so you know what questions to ask of the applicant so that you can figure out if she's met her burden of proof if you don't understand the information that she has provided. So I'm sorry that that isn't practical. It's called following the law. No one here has the right to deviate the law. That's up to the planning mission if they decide to change your ordinance and change the requirements of saying that something is in a historic uh, building, if it is on the historic registry, sorry. It's in the demolition section, and you have to follow the law. If she hasn't produced information other than fifty thousand dollars to move this shed somewhere else, and the barn is going to cost seventy grand, that has nothing to do with undue financial hardship. We have no relevant information about what money is produced by this property. Is it something that that leads one to believe that there is a financial hardship, and that is not the demonstration? Okay. Lastly, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank well, you. I thank you. Thank you. Lastly, let me say one more thing. This notion of limiting people to two minutes during a quasi-judicial hearing shows me and demonstrates that the board does not understand its different roles. It has public here, public meetings where it allows people who want to speak on non-agenda items to weigh in and they can you know, limit the amount of time that people you know talk about non-agenda items. This is a different matter. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. And you don't just open it up as a free for all for anybody who wants to talk for two minutes. You figure out who is an interested party, and you allow them to present their evidence. You allow them to ask information from the applicant, not through some other person. We were trying to get evidence, but I was not allowed to do so because I was limited to two minutes just to say what I need to say, which is not what a lawyer does. A lawyer presents evidence, asks questions, so that the tribunal can get that information, utilize it, and apply the law to the facts of the case. Okay. So I'm very distressed about this, and I think it is a deprivation of the due process. So I do appreciate you letting me finish my, my due process. Thank you. 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 Thank
is Elliot Curtin present? Elliot is here in person, and Les Church is present on Zoom. Hi, Les. Thank you. And then I also see that we have Paige Garten, Lynn Wells, and Betty Crawford. Are you all here to participate in this? Are you all here to participate in this application? Mostly to listen for me. Okay. But thank you. And Lynn? Yes, it's me. Dave is there to represent us. David. David is going to represent you. Okay, I'll get right over to David in a second. And then um, Betty, are you are you here for the Elm Street discussion? Yes, I am. Thank you. And in person, David? David Wells, great. David and Lynn, okay. Thank you, thank you all for waiting. Thank you for being here on a, a Tuesday evening. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, this is a 485 Elm Street. We're going to be talking about shared parking and perhaps about um, riparian buffers as well. Um, we're going to take a similar approach um, structurally to the previous, um, uh, application you heard in which we receive an overview from Meredith, an overview from the applicants, um, a couple minutes each from other parties and participants so as a board we can sort of hear what's on your mind whether those are concerns or support. Um, after each of those board members will ask questions and then we'll go through the, um, the criteria and the considerations within our staff reports. Um, at the end, um, we'll, we'll do a wrap up if we need to, um, depending on, on where things land. So what I, what I will start by doing, as I did before, is swearing in anybody who would like to speak on this matter. Um, so if you think you might have even, even a comment, an opinion, or a fact, whatever you like, um, please raise your right hand. And um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give under the pains and penalties of perjury shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? That makes sense. All right. Yes. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you all for doing that. All right. Great. So I'll turn to Meredith for an overview, please. Can I just add one thing real quick? Oh, yes, Rob. Uh, I don't think it's an issue. Elliot Curtin uh, did do work on my house uh, in uh, 2020. Um, okay. But um, I, don't, I don't foresee a conflict, but I'm disclosing that to the board. So. Okay. That work is, is completed? Yes. Okay. I knew we were familiar. <laughs> <laughs> he was really paying attention to your house, Rob. Sorry about that. But actually, that's probably, probably a good thing, right? All right. Thank you for disclosing. Does anyone participating have an issue with that? OK. All right. Thank you. All right. Overview from Meredith, please. Uh, just one second. Betty, was your hand raised because of the uh, swearing in? If so, you can just do star nine and the hand raise will go away. Uh, if you have a question, then you feel free to do star six. And if you have a process question, do star six and unmute and then ask the question. Okay. I think I'm gonna go forward. Feel free, Betty, if you need to, to email me if you're having some technology difficulties and I can I'm also keeping an eye on email and just because it's hard to hard to remember sometimes on the fly you said star six is on mute star six I believe is unmute and star okay. nine is putting your hand up and down okay thanks okay thank you Betty yes okay <laughs> uh, did, so did you have a question Betty or was the hand raising for the swearing in my hand was raised for the swearing in. Okay. I'm sorry, this is the first time I've ever done this. So. That's okay. Uh, you're, you're doing great. This is the first time we've ever done this in person and Zoom at the same time. So yes. okay. we're, we're, we're all having firsts tonight. We're in it together. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So... Um, uh, you know, everybody who, who got the packet ahead of time has had a chance to review the staff report. I'm going to give a little bit of an overview, and as I've been thinking about this, there's just sort of a way to describe the situation that I hadn't really pulled together in the staff report, and so I'm going to throw that in here as well. Um, so this application began with a complaint from an abutting property owner and an enforcement proceeding at the zoning administrator level, myself. Um, and essentially two activities occurred without a permit. 
there was new impervious surface created at 485 Elm Street. And then a business at 4 Cumming Street was using that impervious surface for off-street parking. Um, the impervious surface could have been approved administratively. In reviewing the way the regulations are drafted as they are written, which as zoning administrator, I have to enforce them as written. I am not allowed to use discretion when there's gray areas, nothing like that, right? Um, I could not approve the use of that gravel lot as parking for a commercial entity as these regulations are written. So this is why this is before you. Um, I could have, they could have come to me and said, hey, grant us this permit, here's the application, and then I deny it, and then it comes here anyway. Or it just comes here as an application. Given the situation, I opted to let them just come here with the application as a way to try and resolve this, this zoning issue. Um, so there's a couple of complications um, that are noted in the staff report. One is that the the business at Fort Cumming Street is a non-conforming use in the zoning district in Res 9. Right? I categorized it as a, as a contractor's yard. Um, and then two, the surface parking use is not allowed in Residential 9. Our definition of surface, first surface parking is very, very, very generic. It basically just says a open lot or a structure used for parking. That's what surface parking is. Um, so in, in trying to look at this and what the key question is, I think as I've had even more time to digest it, um, I think a key question is what the board determines is meant by surface parking. So surface parking is not allowed in residential 3000 through residential 2400 or the rural zoning districts. This is all in figure 2-15, the, the use, ta use table. But almost all of the zoning districts, including all of those, require off-street parking. You have to have off-street parking available for your use. And in this section 3011 that requires off-street parking for all of these uses, it allows for shared parking agreements. So it, 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 there, there's this conflict here, right, between, between what is allowed and what isn't allowed based on the way things are defined. Um, and so I think that there's, there's this question of did the council intend to bar surface parking except in the highest density residential districts. So so unless you're in the highest, is, is your only option if you need to get off street parking to be in a residential, you know, that's not on your parcel, to be in those in downtown. Can, can, can somebody in a residential neighborhood who doesn't have enough off street parking not be allowed to use somebody else's driveway because that's surface parking and that use isn't allowed? It's a, it's a weird conundrum as I'm digging continually thinking about this project how how the, and this is why I couldn't I couldn't resolve this mm -hmm. so does shared your question does when parking is shared does it become commercial parking does it, it become surface parking and therefore not allowed right and there's <coughs> nothing in our definition of surface parking <coughs> as a use that says it's commercial mm -hmm. is that just is that an oversight it's I don't know so I, I know this is this is broader, a broader discussion than I normally do at the beginning of an application. <coughs> mm -hmm. This is something that I've been working with for months and months and months. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's um, or at least it feels like that. Yeah. Um, and it was, I, I had, a, had some conversations today um, that had me sort of reframe this a mm -hmm. little bit and how I was thinking about it. Okay. And so those, the, 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 the determination level questions are in the staff report. It just wasn't pulled together in quite that perspective. Okay. Yeah, I, I would add to that by saying, well, it is our job as a body to interpret the law as written in black and white. There are also areas where we need to understand how the pieces of the law interact. And that is those, it is those circumstances that will bring an application to our board for multiple people to discuss and understand rather than 
ask one person to go through a checklist to say that something is or isn't suitable. So that, that's why we're here. Okay. Thank you, uh, Meredith, for that overview. So what I'm going to do now is turn to the applicants, and I'm going to go in the order that is on the staff report and give you collectively a chance to talk a little bit about, um, about the project, what you're asking for, um, and the circumstances. And um, you know, aim for, aim for a few minutes, and, and we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. So I will turn first to, to Cheryl. Um, to Cheryl. Hi. Um, our application contains what we're seeking, which is to park those, to allow those cars to park there just during limited hours, those um, personal vehicles, and as we continue to manage the knotweed infestation down by the river. Um, it sounds like there are other moving parts here, but I don't think I have a lot to add to it. Okay. Thank you. And I, I think you're there with Christopher, so I want to make sure he has an opportunity to speak, if desired. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Cheryl said uh, uh, my feelings as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so next I'll turn to Elliot. If you'd be willing to please come to this round table and speak into the microphone and just identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, my name is Elliot Curtin and uh, 4 Cumming Street, Montpelier. Uh, we're just looking to get two parking spots. Um, and it, yeah, we're just looking to get two parking spots put in the back. Uh, just cars, maybe one truck and a car, uh, office manager, and then the owner of um, Free Range Builders Last Church. And um, obviously they're, they'll be pretty quiet people. There won't be a lot of noise from from those individuals at this time or ever. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. Okay. Thank you, Elliot. You can stay there, Elliot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If David wants to talk, he's got the microphone over there. Right. And I will also um, next turn to Les, if you'd like a chance to, to chime in. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks. All right. Great. So, um, yeah, there's a... Uh, we have a number of vehicles. We have some front of the building parking, but we are constantly moving vehicles um, at this point um, to get to jockey around out there and make sure people can come and go. Um, an extra two spaces in the back would definitely help alleviate that one. Um, I think at this point we're uh, agreeing no trailers or any commercial vehicles other than uh, a pickup truck would be back there. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. So we're just looking to make it a little bit more means of use for the businesses. Okay. Thank you, Les. Um, okay, so in the order that I laid out, I said we would hear from the applicants and then give board members a chance to ask a few questions. And then we'll turn to other folks who wish to speak. So let's maybe do some kind of high-level orientation questions from board members to the applicants, if, if you have any. I'll, I'll kick it off while people are thinking. What is the required number of parking spaces for this particular use, contractor's yard? Oh. oh I guess that would be for Meredith. Yeah, so you mean the minimum? The minimum required spaces for this use. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's because it's a contractor's yard, it's considered commercial. Um, no customers visit the site. And so the with the 2,112 square feet of the interior of the building, um, it's a required minimum of two parking spaces. And then the maximum that I could approve administratively would be four. Once they go for more than four, they need to come to the board for approval. And so their total here, the request is five, counting the shared, um, you know, shared parking agreement. Okay. So even the, the, the max you can approve administratively is four? Right. Or the most number of parking spaces I could approve would be four. But if it's considered to be commercial, does that change that? No, this is the this is the because it's a commercial. So this is a the calculation is um, based on it being a commercial use with no customers visiting the site. So then, um, 
sorry, I, I didn't, I don't think okay, I put the actual calculation in here for you, and I'm sorry about that. If you give me one second. Um, so it's based on the square footage of the commercial use, yes. which is the contractor it's, yard. It's the commercial which, square footage within the building, right? We don't count the outdoor storage. So here's a question. Um, up the street from this location is the Timberworks. Yep. How are how is that under what criterion? I'm not going to I'm not going it, to it's the so the Timberworks should have been calculated on this same basis. I didn't do that permit approval. I'm, I'm not going to go. I can't go back and like look at that. But it so, would have so, been because so it was no, approved here, under these regs. Here's the, here, here's the key. Mm -hmm. The key is is that it 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 would or should have been evaluated under this. Yeah, it okay. would have been evaluated under the same standards. Same I don't know if they said they, their their location is designed to be a showpiece. People are supposed to come there. So the exact calculation would have right. been different the ratio would have been different but it still would have been based on the total square footage within the building mm -hmm. right and looking at what's in here as to it's probably commercial use with low customers you know small customer visits mm -hmm. um but they do have customer visits they do have customer yeah. visits it's also there, a yes. different zoning district it is also a different zoning district right. um yeah. but that doesn't but that doesn't, that doesn't it, matter for the parking ratios right. good point good point okay other questions, basic questions to get us oriented. So this application is approval of how many total? Five. So just one more. Right. One more than the max I would allow, but two of those are not on their site itself. So it, it's a, it's a, right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the whole, that's Wait. the whole, that's the, that's, that's the whole conundrum. Okay. <clears throat> That's the whole conundrum. Okay. So uh, I'll ask, because since we're talking about number of spaces, um, when I looked at the map, it looked like the gravel area that we're discussing is larger, can accommodate more than two vehicles. Is, am I reading that correctly? Sure. Yes. Yeah. It can accommodate probably seven to eight. Okay. But for noise sake mm -hmm. and for neighborhood Make sure you're close ease enough of, to the microphone. For neighborhood ease of use and for things like that, there won't be any construction trailers. It'll be Les's truck and the office manager's vehicle. Mm -hmm. And if we have to nail it down to those two vehicles and give you those plates and everything else, we can do it for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the reason I'm asking is that usually when we approve a lot, we approve the lot, and that's about as far as we take it, though I appreciate the offer of license plates. I, I'm not going to ask Meredith to do that enforcement piece. Um, we, don't, we don't want the full. We just want two spots. Yeah, that's so you're requesting two spots. Okay. Um, hey, can I ask a question? Um, not, not just yet, Paige, okay? Okay. I'm okay. going to have anyone with questions um, who, who's not an applicant. I'm not actually looking at you. Um, bring that up um, during, okay. during that, that time. Thanks. Thanks for checking, though. Um, other questions from board members? <clears throat> um, because we're talking about a shared parking arrangement, I think it's okay to ask this and tell me if I'm off base, um, board members or others. But um, I understand from the staff report that 485 Elm Street operates a home-based business that is correctly permitted. And that, looking at the map, that includes some parking. Um, and it is not our job to redo projects, but um, as far when shared parking is considered, I sort of look at all the properties around, and I, I wonder if I'm going to not ask that question. Actually, that that's not what we're talking about here. I'm not brainstorming to tell you what to do. I apologize. I take that back. I just got curious. I'll rein that in. Other questions from people who, that are more directly relevant to what we're talking about. From board members. I said people. I meant board members. We're all people. OK. Um, I am going to turn now to um, to other folks who wish to be heard on this. And um, starting with Paige, please. Um, as a member of the Conservation Commission, um, really the only thing we can consider um, 
is the riparian area, but I'm curious to know if any part of those parking spaces will be on the setback, because that is not, an, if the, the measurements were questionable on, on the diagrams, and I'm, are they very, um, and so two questions with regard to the gravel. One would be if the parking is on the setback, and the other would be, is the gravel more than 20% of the entire setback area? And my assumption is because Chris and Cheryl have this long water line um, boundary that probably they have a bigger setback than, yeah. than a, a big enough setback to accommodate that. But I just yeah. wanted to check. Yeah, thank, thank you for checking that page. Um, in our staff report, I believe it says that the percent coverage is 5.5%. Um, okay. So it, it I missed that. Sorry. yeah, that's okay. okay. There's, there's a lot in there. Um, and, there is. and and the the area that's designated for the vehicles to park in is not within the 25 foot water setback at all. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, While well, you have the the mic page, did did you want to make any additional comments as a as a interested person? Um, no. When when the applicant, well, maybe. When the applicants came to the Conservation Commission, they did mention that their intent was to, over time, get rid of the knotweed um, that was um, in the riparian area. And I guess I would just uh, recommend that, um, that they continue to mow it and, if possible, rake up the mowings because mm -hmm. knotweed can spread from very small amounts. Um, and eventually get rid of that and, and replace with woody vegetation, which the applicants did say they were interested in doing, but that's not in the writing of the application. Okay. All right. Thanks, Paige. Um, appreciate the Conservation, Conservation Commission taking some time on this. Um, all right, so to hear from other folks, um, next I will turn to Lynn and David, and I think I heard Lynn say that David will represent, um, so if, I, if that's correct, please go ahead and uh, take a seat at the guest microphone. If um, you're willing to just introduce yourself and say your address. Absolutely, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I have some concerns, and, and I've put them in writing, and um, I have forwarded them to Meredith, but I have additional copies that I can give to the board this evening. Great, thank you for bringing those. You're welcome. So. My concern starts with, um, you know, I, I feel there should be really strict standards about obtaining variances and um, the project or, or the work that happened on this parcel um, happened without an application and um, it happened without my knowledge or, or I would have brought it up to um, some authority in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. um, the business at Fort Cummings Street originally did not conform to zoning ordinances and this requests to expand non-conforming use on top of the existing conformity. That's a concern for me. Um, this was brought up just previously in the meeting. Um, the Repay Adams party um, and their business already has ample paved parking spaces and does not need additional parking in the gravel lot requested by the permit. Um, having a gravel parking lot used for business directly behind our border in a medium density residential zone inhibits our enjoyment of our property. Um, I've included photos that shows the previous use of many vehicles, some small, some large. Um, so there's the traffic, but also um, my concern previous for the previous use was the noise factor um, that employees would come, some driving motorcycles, and this would start at 7 a.m. and be directly behind our property. So that, that's a great concern of mine. Um, I'm also concerned about um, the riparian um, barrier and the requirements around that. Um, the Repay Adams party is claiming that keeping an impervious um, parking area um, is their effort to control knotweed. Um, but uh, just quickly looking to see um, local experts, the UVM Extension or the Vermont Agency of Fish and Wildlife, they all recommend cutting back knotweed, um, frequent cutting back, and they recommend planting native species, um, but nothing ever um, recommends putting an impervious um, area to prevent knotweed. Um, 
I see no plans for a stormwater control included in the application. Um, that's a concern of mine. And, and in speaking about um, setbacks, um, I know um, we're talking about the setback to the river, but my concern also is that um, if a parking area is established, it directly abuts my property, just, just right smack against it. Um, and that's a concern of mine. Okay. So I'll just conclude, you know, um, oh, also um, in the evidence that I presented, you could see that um, prior to this area being developed, uh, a 2012 um, satellite Google image shows that there was woody vegetation and trees in that area before it was cleared and this project took uh, place. Um, so those are my concerns. When, you, when did you take these photos, the, the ones with the... The photos were over a period of time um, in the um, spring, so basically from the period of February to now, showing the use of the property. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm going to give Elliot a chance to get to the page with the photos. Um, and can I can share it on screen so Cheryl and Chris and other people on Zoom can Thank see you. as well. Thank you for accommodating our Zoom guests. Um, so the pictures that we're looking of, um, the title, they're about to appear. The title of the page is Photos Showing Impact of Parking Area Use. Is, is this the parking area in question, item D on the site plan that we are talking about retroactively approving? So these are photos of the entire parking parcel, okay. um, which was a, a great concern to me. Um, and I'm concerned about the continued limited use in this application. Okay. So I want to make sure that we understand what what is what is part D with on the site plan and how that compares to what what we're looking at on the screen is from here to here D on the site plan. Uh, roughly and if if you look at the truck closest to us the, I'm I'm sorry uh, Kate that that red truck uh, in the corner this one? Yeah. and that other truck roughly those are where the two spots are being asked for roughly here correct here that's correct if mr wells uh, feels that it's uh abutting too close to his property we can take that and go a car length even further over mm -hmm. uh from that okay and mr wells's property is right here that's where that that's fence right. is right okay there. okay, that's okay. thank you so like elm street your house, parking area, river. Correct. Okay. And I just wanted to add, as far as uh, the riparian barrier and, and, and Japanese knotweed goes, uh, we went through an extensive bridge construction project on Cumming Street right. that I was more than willing to participate in and help the city and the state in any way I could. Um, one of the things that they did for Japanese knotweed mediation was put down weed mat and stone on the side banks from the bridge, probably 35 feet down river, uh, which is basically what I did in my backyard or their backyard. So the state obviously did that, and we followed suit in that. Okay. Thanks for that point of reference. Yep. Um, okay. So um, I. Uh, it looks like more than two vehicles in, in that area. And we're not asking for that. We're only asking for two vehicles. I went under, again, extensive bridge construction project. I needed more storage. We had a storage container out there that's okay. been moved. Okay. Everything that has been asked of me on that property, I've done. Okay. I've done light control. I've done parking control. I've told my guys not to make noise in the morning. I've moved the whole location. I've bought a whole entire new, new place to go. Okay. So I can get in more trouble elsewhere in Montpelier. And that's the North Franklin's, or the sorry, the Franklin Street, that's um, which I think we got reference to in our in our um, staff packet. Um, okay, thank you. Um, do you know, what was the date on on the photos that you provided here, Dave? Do you know, um, David? No, I don't have. I have the approximate date, so it would be between um, February 2021 and um, this month. Okay. 
And was yeah. that July? No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, to be clear, because the parties were following the request of, um, of Meredith that when they were to stop using that, they stopped using that. Okay. So, so it would be right. February till whenever that date was, June 1st. February until they were told May to stop, 15th, and at I which believe. point they did. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So February 2021, was the bridge project completed? Uh, February, yeah, the bridge project was complete by then. Okay. And we could use the front of the shop at that time. Okay. All right. Um, good. We are going to um, make sure that we hear from um, Betty as well. Um, I, I do want to just look to Lynn, see if there's anything that's come up. I'm looking if there's anything she would like to add. I ask everybody who's present if they want to speak. So Lynn or Betty, uh, Lynn's okay. shaking her head okay. no. Uh, so Betty, if you wanted to talk, you'll need to unmute with your star six. Sure, go Hi. ahead. Hello, Betty. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Um, um, I live directly across the river from <clears throat> the uh, Rippey Adams building, and I have a problem with the, destroy, the destruction of the view. I have a view of somebody's parking lot now. All winter long, I've had um, uh, hydraulic lifts, storage, pallet storage, trucks shining in my deck doors at night, motorcycles in the morning. It's been a lot of noise. I don't understand um, when they took over this building, there was pre-existing parking in the front of the building, and there still is. I don't understand why that isn't being utilized. And so I, I just don't see a need for any parking lot behind that building, any parking spaces at all. Thank you, Betty. Um, okay. Um, does anyone have any questions for Betty or or David at, at or Paige at this point? Oh, Meredith, you want to ask something? Just make sure you're talking about board. Board questions. Thank you. That is that is important. And if I can, uh, my wife uh, actually got kicked out of the meeting and is waiting. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I, Lynn. Thank you can't you. hear me. Yeah, we'll just, twice. we'll just take a uh, second to make sure that works. Okay. Okay. Thanks Sorry, for that. Sorry, Lynn. Not Thanks. quite sure what happened. Okay. Um, questions from board members? Um, I, I think we. Uh, Kate, this is, Kate, this is Abby. Yeah, go ahead, Abby. Um, I'm wondering if the applicant could talk about the alternative to uh, creating these two spaces, and if, if kind of what alternatives or other scenarios they may have explored. One alternative was to move out of that location, and that yeah, was so that's done. That's what you, what Elliot that's did with his business, done. and Les is still so there. So Les, right? there was two two companies in that one building. Now there's just one company, and free range builders just they do such great work that they're they have to expand, so they have to add uh, another vehicle. So okay. Thanks. So that's also a good reminder that we're talking about two businesses using the same location. One one of those businesses has found an additional site or alternative. Ad alternative, additional. You're moving. Uh, al uh, al alternative, two separate businesses. Yeah. yeah. So is, um, the, is the utilization of the, the the two businesses using the same site, is that a temporary solution? No, so that's that. So I... I removed everything off site. I have no vested interest in that building except I keep one office. And that's the office manager that has yeah, one office. And hence the one the parking one, spot. One, okay. one civilian vehicle or okay. whatever you want to call it. Okay. Car. Great. I get it. Yep. So I do want, I think Les has his hand up. I, um, and even if he doesn't mean to have his hand up, I want to invite um, any comment on, on this question. Um, we're a little different business than Elliot's. We want to do longer term projects. Most of our equipment is out quite a long time. Uh, and 
most of our crew is off site. All the time also. But we still need, we have a project manager, an office manager, myself, and usually one other person's in or out for a while. So we're pushing for maybe five spaces. Uh, it's pretty tight out front. And it uh, was really tight when they were doing bridge work, uh, which I think some of those photos in the back parking lot with Jan are from when we had no parking out front. Okay. So. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, other questions from board members? If I'm going slow, it's because I don't want to forget anything. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, Kevin. Motorcycles Kev are on the property too? No, no, absolutely not. Okay. Two, deal, two, uh, two wheel vehicles are no, no more. We can't have that. Yeah. Too noisy. Yeah, well, just, uh, referring to other testimonies. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good to good to confirm that. All right. Um, okay. Back to my notes. All right. So what I'd like to do now, um, this is the point at which we turn to the staff report and the fir and and walk through some things. We may have questions for the applicants or for other folks at this during this process, but. Um, board members, what I would like to do is look at page six of the staff report. At the top, it's in red, um, and there are some threshold determinations about whether the use of 485 Elms land for parking of employees' cars of the adjacent contracting yard. Um, we, we, these are some threshold determinations before we can even decide whether a permit is, is issuable. Um, so the first question is whether this is an expansion of a non-conforming use and if so, whether it may be allowed under 1203D, that is the section of our zoning ordinance. So um, just, just for starters, um, I, I just want to point out that um, nonconforming uses can, can continue. They just can't get bigger. They can change as long as they're not more impactful. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. So. We are talking about um, a business at Four Cummings Street using some space that's part of 485 Elm Street. And we are determining as a board whether that shared parking, whether that, whether the use of that parking expands the non-conforming use. It is on a different parcel. Um, it is being used to allow Four Cummings to continue business. So. Uh, we can either discuss it or just get kind of a quick straw poll on whether we whether we see this as an ex whether we see this parking area as an expansion of the non-conforming use. Would people like me to read the definition of what a contractor's yard is? Because yes. that's yes. what I was determined was the use at Fort Cummings. Thanks. <clears throat> I jumped ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Meredith. One second, I know it's in the staff report. Oh, yeah, okay. So a contractor's yard is defined at section 5101C17 as an establishment that provides storage for vehicles, machinery, equipment, and materials used by a contractor in the construction, building maintenance, or property maintenance trades. It may include a shop for maintaining or repairing the contractor's vehicles, machinery, or equipment, or the contractor's business office. A contractor is a person who builds, demolishes, or performs additions, alterations, reconstruction, installation, and repairs to structures. I think we have a contractor's yard. <laughs> Good. Agreed. Does anyone think it's not a contractor's yard? Well, so from speaking of the front, I would say yes. The mm -hmm. front is definitely a contractor's yard. Mm -hmm. The rear of the building, there are no materials that I know of. Everything has been removed from the rear of that building, except for seven orange cones. When you say, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt you for a sec. When sure. you say rear of the building, does that, is that part of the four coming street parcel? Or the 485 Elm 485 parcel. 485 Elm parcel. I'm, I'm intentionally splitting hairs there. Okay, no, that's um, fine. Yeah. But sure. yeah. yeah. Okay. So I would say that the rear uh, is not a contractor's yard per se, okay. in, in what you're saying. The okay. front, definitely. Okay. 
So the four Cummings parcel is a contractor's yard. So we need to determine whether, and it's a non-conforming use, which means it can continue as long as it doesn't get bigger. Is, the con is it getting bigger? I, I will share that as one board member, I don't think that the, con the non-conforming use is expanding because the property being used that's auxiliary does not belong to Fort Cummings Street. And it, there's an intensification of use in the area, but not on the parcel. So I do not think it's an expansion of a non-conforming use. Just a reminder, we're talking about what's being requested, not what has happened in the past, right? I guess so. I guess, well, uh, yeah. Well, we can't when the make a determination on what's happened in the past. That's all. Exactly. Right, right, exactly. That's what I was just, I was just throwing that. that out there. Right, I dealt with that. <laughs> so we're not talking pre-existing non-conforming use. We're well, just talking. No, no the, the what's going on at Fort Cummings itself, right? Sure. So the question is, is the is the having parking at 485, which is what's requested, an expansion of the pre-existing non-conforming use at Fort Cummings, right? Pre Fort Cummings is the pre-existing non-conforming use. Is their request to have two parking spaces on 485 an expansion of that pre-existing non-conforming use, or is it basically, is it, is it a shared parking agreement to have parking on somebody else's parcel that does not expand the contractor's yard. Right. Does, the, does the time at which parking began on um, the Elm Street parcel have any bearing? No, I stopped that. Okay. That's done. The parking that happened before is done. Okay. They're asking for new parking. We, right? we have to, we're, we we're have to view this new. very, very discreetly, just okay. what's being Sorry. requested <laughs> today. So other thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot because these are threshold determinations and we have to decide before we move on. Hi, I, I agree that this is not a continuation of a non-conforming use on forthcoming. Thank you, Abby. Um, do you mean expansion or continuation? Thank you. Expansion. <laughs> Sorry, it's not an expansion of it. Okay, thanks. I guess I would agree with the same. The reason it didn't make sense is because it's not an expansion of a non-conforming use of Fort Cummings. That's why it didn't make sense to me. Right, because it isn't. After careful examination, I can Okay. Can I can I note that Mr. Church did comment that his business was expanding because it was they were busy? Uh, just the, the business can expand with, we're going to, thanks, we're going to take that as it is. It may. That's it, a good point. I think Elliot said my business wasn't expanding. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. That is true because he does such a good job. That's free range builders. <laughs> <laughs> Contact Elliot for the website. Okay. So, um, so, right, so they have it, more business. They're not expanding. They have more more business. That's not the same thing as expansion with of the non-conforming use. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it to board members for the moment. Um, so, Kevin, would you like to weigh in on this? Do you feel that it is an expansion, or is or is not an expansion of I, the I current? I do not see it as an expansion. Okay. So we um, we do not see it as an expansion of the non-conforming use. Okay. So then the next question we need to think about is, is the area that we're talking about, where two parking spaces are being requested, because that's the discrete thing under discussion, is it properly categorized as a surface parking use? Um, and again, do you want me to read the definition? Please, please, thanks. Uh, surface parking is defined at section 5101P5 as an outdoor site used to store passenger vehicles or site intended to store passenger vehicles at ground level under a roofed open air structure, right? So you have two different options. Um, it can just be site used to store passenger vehicles, 
or it can be something with a structure that stores them at ground level under a roofed open air structure. Um, there is no further definition. It does not say it has to be commercial. It does not define it as separately from two parking spaces on somebody's house. It, there's there's no other expansion of that definition. Um, the other place to get clarification on that, really, the only other place to get clarification on how that is worked is in the use table itself, where it says that surface parking, so this is uh, your figure 2-15 under the under the transportation facility uses. It says surface parking is permitted, that means allowed with an administrative permit, in the downtowns, so UC1, UC2, UC3, the riverfront, which again is along the river, um, and this is along the uh, Winooski itself, um, like along Elm Street, um, Berry Street, not Elm Street, sorry, along Berry Street, that's riverfront. Um, Eastern Gateway and Western Gateway. So those are the far out along Memorial Drive. Um, and then it's a conditional use in mixed use residential and in res 1.5. So these are all the highest density locations and locations where a lot of commercial um, is allowed mm -hmm. or res 1.5, which is really some tight residential. And then I'm it's permitted in municipal and then it's not allowed at all in any of the other residential districts. I think that based on the use table and where surface parking is an allowed versus a conditional use versus a prohibited use, we can use that to interpret surface parking as being additive beyond a driveway um, for a typical residential. I don't think that, even though it's a very generic definition, I don't think we can say that if you have space for three vehicles in your yard, then that is necessarily <clears throat> surface parking. The fact that surface parking is defined and permitted in, in more commercial areas, um, right up to and including medium, or res 1.5, I think that would lead me to conclude that surface parking is kind of over and above your standard parking, and it would be adding added parking um, constructed just for that purpose. But I'm just one board member. I would agree. <laughs> um, any further discussion by board members of, of sur surface parking, the definition? No. Okay, so I'm going to do a straw poll, and we will ultimately vote on these things, but. Um, do we believe that this area in question is properly categorized as surface parking? I think yes, it is properly categorized as surface parking. So it is, the area D is the surface parking that's limited to those zoning districts? Yes. I think, meaning it's prohibited in the zoning district that we're talking about. Right. Yes, that's, that's well, yes, it's surface parking as I've just interpreted it, yes. That's, that's my view. That, that it's surface parking, but can, can be an additive use in Res 9 or cannot be an additive use. I'm just asking the one question, is it surface parking or not? Okay. And surface parking, it if it's surface parking is not allowed in Residential 9, right. in this current area. It right. is only allowed in certain areas. So as, as you answer, you know, do, do consider that. And as I was thinking about this, I feel like I'm talking too much, but, um, you know, there is a question to be had, which is, is this an accessory use? Is the parking area an accessory use to 485 Elm? And I do not see it as an accessory use to 485 Elm because there is existing supplemental parking at 485 Elm, supplemental to the primary use, is, is my thinking. And I'm happy to have others. What's the impact of... Of of uh, non-conforming surface parking use. The non-conforming use that we've discussed is the contractor's yard. Um, I don't think we're talking about surface par the parking as non-conforming use. 
are we? I'm sorry. Yeah, Kevin, can you rephrase the question? Because I didn't even follow that either. Okay, so what's the impact of where we're heading with this, with the straw poll results? That's a, that, that's a fair question. Um, these are threshold questions to determine whether the use that for which a permit is being applied for is allowed in the district. As if we want to take a hypothetical from some other place. If we had a rural district where someone was proposing um, a water park, and water parks were not an allowable use in the rural district, we wouldn't be talking about it. Right. And similarly, we're talking about whether this use is even eligible to apply for a permit in this district. So there are implications, serious implications to what I'm asking. What are the specific implications for this project we're reviewing? So if, sorry, can I? Yeah, please, like, please. So if, if the entangled. board determines that the area D, the new gravel area to be used, you know, and the use of it, it, it that the, the board determines that the use of the new gravel area on 45 Elm Street is, meets the definition of a surface parking use, then there's no way to approve the permit request. There's, there's no, I, I see no way to do that. So the, the, it, there's one site, one space in jeopardy. Two, two spaces. They're two asking spaces. for two spaces back there, right? Okay. Um, there are ramifications, right? So big picture, if that's what the board decides, then if somebody comes to me with an application for something like this where you have two parcels, right, that have face, they're near a corner, so they're on two different streets, and they want to create a rear parking space it's just two homes and somebody wants to use somebody else's backyard for a parking space because it works with the way it works i wouldn't be able to allow that if it the way we've just talked about it unless resident a's request for parking is in resident b's parking lot that's already existing if they're creating a new space just for access for this out off street you know off site parking mm -hmm. even if it's two homes I'm going to say it's not allowed if it's in a zoning district where surface parking is not allowed. Which is a res nine. Right, res nine, right. res three, res six, okay. right. any of those. But in this case, thanks for that nuance. Right. No, that doesn't that the, the uh, not here. Here it's not allowed at all. All of those res districts I just it has a dash. It's not allowed. Period, as a surface parking use. Um, well, I, I do so it. this is the this is the question. Does mm -hmm. does does surface parking mean to get out of the surface parking box and have a shared parking agreement? Does the where you're going to park and share? Does it have to be an already existing hmm. parking area? Does it have to be in somebody's driveway? Right. So what is my what are you asking me to approve for future permit applications? What can I and can I not approve? Um, typically, uh, I'm going to double check because I mean this would also probably come back to you because off-site parking. Um, but while you're looking that up, I'm going to acknowledge that we have some hands ra hands raised, and I can I can see that over my shoulder. But we'll, we'll try to get to that soon. Um, sorry, uh, shared parking. Sorry, I'm losing my spot. Um, a shared parking agreement does not necessarily have to be approved by the DRB. Right, right. Right? So I need, I need guidance from you if you're going to tell me that this is surface parking and therefore cannot be approved here, then if I get a shared parking agreement from somebody else where they just want to park off, I, I can't approve it, right? If it's any of these residential districts, okay. unless it's in an existing driveway. Okay. Is the way we're yeah. interpreting what you're saying. So what, what, what we're talking about, it, it, what is that? Thank you all for bearing with us. This is not, this is, this is unique. So we're trying to treat it as such. We're trying to be contact, con context specific while also implementing the law. So sometimes that takes time. Um, 
we're basically would be saying that building something for use as parking is automatically surface parking. And does that also mean if it's an expansion of an existing driveway just to do it? Well, I think that would be a different yeah. set okay. of facts and a different conversation. Okay, and I okay, wouldn't, so I wouldn't right be now, willing to set precedent okay. on that. Okay, so, yeah. so but right now, this part, mm -hmm. building a new area specifically for parking for somebody else mm -hmm. who is not part of that parcel. Mm -hmm. So parcel A builds a parking area for parcel B's use. It's surface parking, no matter what the uses involved are. I'm just try I'm trying to get guidance for when people come to me this with applications. Is right. This is all right. I think we have to be careful. It was, it was, it was an intention here to, to not allow check surface parking in res 3, 6, and 9 in the regs. And whether I agree with that or not, I mean, that's pretty clear. But, and so that's why I'm just making sure this, everybody, that's yeah. why we have to, you have to, I need you all to say, yes, this is surface parking. Yes, yes it's a surface parking. So Rob okay. and Jean and Kate and Kevin. Yeah. Okay. And Abby, do you want to? We just have to be very, go very ahead, Kevin. aware of what the implications. Right. Are. Yes. Yes. And because this can be an economic burden. Well, yeah. well, and the other thing is, if this is how the board is interpreting this, mm -hmm. I also I need to go back to Mike Miller and make sure that that is what people intended when they wrote it. Because if it was what they intended, great, we're doing what they wanted. If it wasn't. They have work to do. That, that well, yes, we're we're interpreting it abs separate from their intentions, Wait, which exactly. is our job. Um, but if they want something different to have come out of a conversation like tonight, they should watch the Language. tune in. Yeah, and watch the video. I didn't mean. To, I'm sorry, Kevin. I cut you off. Nope, you're you're good. Okay, Abby, um, is it surface parking? Abby, you need to unmute star six. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, but I think it is okay. surface parking. Okay. So I, I, I wish that there were. I wish that there were more clarity. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the way that I'm interpreting it is similar to, to the other board members. Okay. Thank you, Abby. So I consider that a straw poll. Um, so I'm just going to pause. I many have had their yellow hands up very patiently. So um, I I want to turn to Cheryl next to speak. If you'd like to add anything, Cheryl, thanks for your patience. Thank you. It's true that we at 485 Elm don't need more parking as such, but we are using the entrance off Cummings uh, by the generosity of Elliot and Les to access our lower yard, and that's the only way we can get down there to do things like riparian buffer improvement. We had all kinds of tree planting there recently and the ongoing effort against the knotweed. Um, so, so there is a purpose to that area for us as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, Betty, I think you have your hand up. I don't know if you mean to, but I will check in. You can star six to unmute or star nine to put your hand down. And now you're unmuted, Betty, just so you know. It's hard to see when you're not on the Zoom. Okay. Okay. Hey, I did not mean to unmute. That's okay. I didn't mean to put put you on the spot. You can find if you, okay. if you star six, you can remute. All right. I'm just making sure we're tracking everybody. Thank you. All right. Um, I appreciate this discussion. Um, it is not easy um, for anyone. So... Um, what we do next, oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, if you wouldn't mind using the mic. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So just for me, what we're looking at, I think the, uh, the historical context that we've talked about is important here. Um, in 2012, this, the area that we're talking about um, was a wooded area that's part of the 485 parcel, and then the uh, Four Cumming Street, which was already a non-conforming use um, when it was a well drilling company. Mm -hmm. um, so it was non-conforming. Um, I feel that this is an expansion. Um, the, the use of the parking area 
um, came after all of this was cleared, um, and it um, became part of a legal agreement between the two parties. So I, I see it as as connecting. Um, you know, for me, the knotweed is a concern, um, but nowhere in my research from experts does it talk about. Um, people putting a parking area in the riparian barrier. Yeah. I know the Department of Transportation may do that when they build a bridge, but I think that's a different matter and yeah. different rules. If, if, if I may, I, this is captured well in your written testimony and okay. your previous testimony. So if you have anything new to add, I'd, I'd welcome it. Um, and I also will go back and remind myself as well that Meredith, we're, we're sort of looking at this um, just for what's being requested, the two, the two spots, but um, we, we are approving being asked to approve two spots in the in this area at the dimensions presented. Yeah. I, um, I, I yeah. appreciate that. Okay. It's still just my concern that it's an expansion okay. of the area. Okay, so Thank you do you. see it as an expansion of the non-conforming use is, is what I'm noting. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, our next threshold determination, we're still at the threshold, we haven't gone through the door. Um, is that um, the board needs to determine whether, despite what we've just, oh, Meredith, do you wanna direct us? Uh, I don't know if the next. Roman three. Maybe a lot of okay, yeah, never mind. Go ahead. So you, you've invited us to consider um, whether, despite what we've just discussed about the non-conforming use expansion and the categorization as a surface parking use, despite what we've just discussed, is it possible for this to be allowed as part of a shared parking agreement under 3011, which is the section of the bylaw. Um, you invited us to consider that. Is there more to add on that? No, this is just, part of this is leading you through the thought process I've been going through in trying to figure out how these all go together while trying to figure out if there's a path forward for approval of the permit. Okay. So we are noodling on shared parking and whether that is a different thing than anything else we've been discussing and whether that different thing would provide a path forward for the applicants. Um, um, so shared parking um, in our bylaws, what it tells us to do is um, there's a calculation for the total amount of shared parking required. It says a shared parking plan may be approved in, in to allow parking to be shared by two or more uses or to be provided offsite in accordance with the following. Determining the minimum parking requirements, figuring that out, calculating the total for what time of day different cars are going to be there, select the highest total as required. Um, other standards, any shared or off-site parking shall be located within a thousand foot walk of the associated users. We've received testimony in our packet that that is the case. Any shared or off-site, uh, the applicant shall submit a written agreement between the owners and the lessees, et cetera. We do have evidence of that. The applicant shall submit plans showing the location of the uses or structures for which the parking shall be provided, et cetera, how it's relative, how the parking relates to the buildings that are using it. So um, the question for the board to consider is, does the presence of a shared parking agreement um, change the allowability of this use in this district? Can I just step in real uh -huh. quick? Yep. So the thing to keep in mind is that shared parking 311E is referenced for when the board may waive some or all off-street parking requirements, right? So every, every use has a required minimum number of parking spaces. If a parcel cannot meet those minimum number of parking spaces, which I, I, I know is not the case here, Right, but if that happens, the board can waive some of those requirements to the extent that, and one option is the applicant meets the requirements for shared parking in paragraph 3011E, right? So that would mean that in those districts that don't, if, if, if we take this, the surface parking use and say it it, it can't be used under, with this, the, in these other districts, then you basically say you can't have a shared parking agreement to meet your minimum off-street parking requirements in any of those zoning districts where surface parking is not an allowed use. 
if you follow through on the the full spectrum of saying shared parking has you know what i mean so it it would only you'd only be able to use existing parking it would clearly have to be shared parking right where it is a it has to be shared it has to be used by multiple uses mm -hmm. including the parcel yeah the the parcel on which it is the, the use for which, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. sorry. Okay. It would have to be basically in Cheryl and Chris's driveway. That's the only place that they could offer a shared parking agreement. Mm -hmm. I'm just making sure everybody is aware of the ramifications. With right, with, with, with the DRB granting that right. waiver of the minimum parking. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, mean I, I, I read this my gut tells me is that the whole idea of shared parking and service parking was the whole idea of like shared parking and service parking in here was geared towards development in the more congested downtown areas now I don't necessarily maybe agree with that but I just see where the check boxes are and that shared parking was not necessarily or shared parking plans were not necessarily you know intended here to exist um, in uh, you know the more rural um, less dense districts. That's what. That's the way I read the regs, and that's the. When you look at a number of different things in the regs, I, I get the sense that, um, well, that <laughs> there just wasn't a whole lot of thought maybe put to or <laughs> the the less dense, uh, more rural, you know, di districts, uh, and it's possible that something was left out. And I don't think it's our job to necessarily like fill in the fill in the blanks in this particular instance because uh, it, it does seem like it's 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 pretty. Unfortunately, it's clear, even though it may not have been intended. Yeah, I, I think that's really true. I think I think what we're dealing with is unintended consequences. Of, 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 I think we're dealing with unintended consequences of, in the new zoning regs, which haven't, you know, we're just now beginning to flush it out, flush it out, and it's. Uh, I mean, I I don't like where this is going, but I I would agree with you that the language is pretty specific. I think there's been areas where we've been able to use our discretion to sort of like overlook that, but unfortunately here it, it, it just seems like it's 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 so it's so clear it's hard to find a way around it. I wish I could find a way around yeah, it. I, <laughs> I mean, I think I think we're boxed in. Yeah. I, I would note that the other the condition that can lead to a shared parking agreement is a request for a waiver of the minimum parking requirements, and we are talking about granting parking that is over what the minimum requires. So that's another. That's another that, that requires snag, that requires so. a separate application and warning. Yeah. yeah, and it's not what the businesses need. Right. Yeah, um, Abby, would you like to weigh in here? Um, I, I, I don't think this is shared parking agreement. It doesn't sound like that because it's not truly shared. It's for the purpose of, of one of the parties oh. that's another point thank you <laughs> yep so I think that where this leads us is um, because these are threshold issues um, I, I what I would recommend is that we have a motion to to indicate what we have words I'm going to figure out the words here um, we need to a motion that indicates our conclusion that the use proposed is surface parking um, is what is the pleasure of the board and we can we can pause this is like I said this isn't this is novel this is different than what we've encountered I don't want to rush anybody into anything but I let's, don't want to belabor it if it's... Let's take it into deliberative. Well, so here's... Um, that is one option, except that um, we would have to close the hearing mm -hmm. on this application, and we, if we do determine that, surf that it's not surface parking and it's an allowable use, they would have to rewarn the entire rest of the application to be heard on approval of this, of this project. Okay. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, may I make a, may I just talk procedure yeah, here? Yep. Um, the board can have a motion about whether 
just you know motion that the board find that the use requested on 485 Elm Street would be surface parking use as defined in the regs. So that would be your motion. That doesn't end everything right now. You can still then go into deliberative session as to how to deal with the rest of the app, the application right. as a whole. I see. Because whatever way, the, the final decision, there's going to need to be some guidance in there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as to how, I, how we're supposed to work with the regs, right? But you can make that motion now and then also do a deliberative session okay. to find it, finalize everything if you want. Um, you but, could also, you know, if anything, we need that motion to just get a on the record vote as to where people lie on that determination. Yeah. I would recommend that we take that approach. Um, I want to ask the applicant how, how they want to proceed, given that we've, they kind of know where the board is going. <laughs> do they, need, do they want to, you know, need more time to bring more information or anything like that? I don't, think that, I don't know. I'm interested. That's, that's a fair that's a fair question is it, based on the long discussion you've you've joined us for this evening and thank you again um, do you feel that there is applicants so I'll, I'll look at all the applicants um, do you feel that there is additional information that would um, enlighten the board based on what we have discussed and the sorts of interpretations that we are bound by and, and considering and we can take five for people to chat at the sidebar. Is that yeah. for sure? If you guys, I don't know if you have. Would separate, you like to talk if to you guys? If you and Cheryl and Les want to have a separate call or something outside, um, I don't. I don't know if that's necessary. But you also don't have to. I, think uh, we're just I guess I could I call Les and, and and Cheryl and Chris, so we could do a three-way call. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to do that it's, out in the hallway, that's it's fine. It's not a requirement. We just want to preserve a little space for you. Um, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I feel comfortable. It looks like, um, would it be any different if I own that parcel of land? That's a good question. Um, how are we allowed to talk about that? Well, that that could be, go back to our first the, question the regarding the expansion. The sale itself wouldn't be actionable but if if you combine the lots then you'd be operating under a or do adjustment a new adjustment um I, I think there are two factors to consider one it would probably still be considered surface parking which would probably still not be an allowable use in the area why would it be surface parking oh it wouldn't be surface parking if lots. you owned it right. Let's get right. that all right it's getting late um then the question would be would it be considered an expansion of a non-conforming use and there could, right? Yeah, that's, is, is that? <laughs> you're, you guys are hitting all the conundrums I hit like every yeah. time before okay. you came here. Could that yeah. be another application, uh, Kate? Yeah, they would then be, have to yeah, come back. And you have to come back, yeah. yeah but. So it sounds to me like we're good then, as far as denied. The application would be as, denied, correct? As far as there, there is clarity anyway. OK. I imagine if, yeah. I would understand if you're not good with it. but. Um, it's clear anyhow yeah. what, what, no, what, how we've that. thought through it and yeah. where we are. Sure. Um, so Thank to you. be clear, we have not voted as a board to deny the application. Um, sure. You've heard us think through it and you sure. understand yeah. how the criteria are yeah. or aren't met. Thank you for taking your time. I appreciate it. Well, sure, sure. And, and, and I we're, appreciate we're everybody. We're constrained by what the ordinance actually sure. says. Sometimes, sometimes that language is, is – um, general enough that we can make an interpretation but in this specific instance it's pretty clear yeah 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 so i, I so have is all the information that i have okay to make a decision here i mean i know there's more but i think the threshold is sort of got us in a place where okay. just make sure you're at the mic so that when it oh. comes time for the minutes tammy okay. can hear so is is there a motion uh wait hold on les has got his hand up oh sorry les please go ahead uh, just back to the uh uh, the use of that space, uh, Cheryl. Um, yeah, basically, is using that access for their property, mm -hmm. for their business at that point, as well as for some parking area. 
So that goes back to whether or not it is a shared parking area. Is that what you're asking, Les? That, because that Cheryl and Chris are using it for something? Okay. Are they using it for parking? They use it to bring, yeah. they usually bring compost and things into their okay. business. Okay. Um, board members, does that change your thinking on shared parking? And whether the presence of a shared, is it shared parking because it's used as a back and forth way? Um, and if it's shared parking, does it um, supersede the zoning regulations on, on that issue? On, on the surface on the surface parking, parking. Yeah. definition. Surface yes, parking. thank you. Not just right. totally, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the shared parking intent in these regulations is not what I, what I see here. You know, unfortunately, I, I think mm -hmm. it was... It was, it's, it's different. And I, think I explained earlier what I thought shared parking was in here for and intended, and you know where it was envisioned. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, um, it doesn't appear that it was envisioned in these districts. Mm -hmm. What is the definition of shared parking? Uh, I would refer to uh, the section of the regs. We'll, we'll read that again just so well, we we're don't, on the There same isn't less, like a definition of shared parking. There's a definition for surface parking. Right. So it sounds like the, the issue is that it's the, it's the surface parking definition, right? Yes. And how that interacts with the shared parking allowance. Right. Okay. Yep. And our question, what we should be considering is, does the presence of a shared parking agreement mean that something is less surface parking than it would be otherwise? Um, for me, the intent behind the shared parking appears to be to minimize overall amount of parking because it is triggered by um, a request for a reduction in the parking requirement, in the minimum parking requirement. Okay. All right. Maybe another couple hours. <laughs> we hope not. Yeah. Um, all right, so with that in mind, is, is there a motion? Um, we've discussed the possibility of a motion. D does a motion to, for the board to find that the proposed use is surface parking and to close the hearing on this application and enter into deliberative session at the conclusion of this public meeting? So move. Motion by Jean. Second. Second by Kevin. I'll call the roll. Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. Rob? Yes. Abby? Yes. And I also vote yes. Um, that is what we will do. We will deliberate. Um, we will issue a written decision in as timely a manner as we possibly can. Um, and we really appreciate your time. We appreciate, um, I personally appreciate that you run a business, and that's work. And um, thank you for thank you for your for efforts. Your I appreciate okay. your volunteer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, um, Zach, you're next. I want to check in with the board and everybody else. Um, do we need to take three? This is an unusually long meeting. Um, it is that. Um, let's take two. Okay. So that we will have totaled a five-minute break, which I think is reasonable. We will um, impose upon Zach's goodwill a little while longer, and then we'll get to yeah. All right, we're back. Thank you so much for waiting. Oh, it's nice Thank to you see you. Thank you all for your service and hanging out here such late. It's <laughs> uh, late for long hours. This is uh, so fun hearing what you all do. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. We're That's glad. nice of you to what? say. Oh. Yes, it is. It's how we roll. So um, I'm going to look behind me and confirm... It looks like there is nobody here to be heard on this matter. Um, I'll dive right in. Um, this is a sketch plan review, subdiv 
sketch plan review of a subdivision. Applicant is Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. And the sketch plan process is a chance for a future applicant to come to the board and get a weather report as far as what what we see when we look, um, when we compare the what's proposed to the standards that it eventually has to meet. It's also a chance for people who are curious about the project to learn more. Um, when we review subdivisions, it's to ensure that any lot we approve is going to be developable in the future, whether that whether that is as the applicant envisions or as or in some other way um, that a future owner of that land might choose to um, develop. So um, this is sketch plan. This is a conversation. I'm not going to swear anybody in. Um, we're just gonna we're gonna get to it. Um, Meredith, do you want to do an overview of this one, and then I'll just I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and and tell us about the project. Uh, so you kind of stole my thunder and did pretty much everything. Um, yeah, as as Kate said, there's no written decision or permit coming out of this discussion. Um, one thing to note is that sketch plan for a subdivision is tied to a deadline, and that once someone goes through the sketch plan review, they have a year to file their final application for actual subdivision, or they have hmm. to start over again from sketch plan. So there is there is that deadline in there. Um, in this instance, uh, applicant has, has presented some ideas regarding how the parcel might be used um, and included a preliminary site plan for discussion purposes. Um, I, in the staff report, I've included some comments on that potential future plan, um, but I've really tried to focus on the subdivision request itself. Um, because I think that's that's the most important part here right now. Um, you know, the the applicant and I have had lots of discussions about future um, development options, and and that discussion um, will have some other other avenues to go forward on. <laughs> All right, thanks, Meredith. Over to you. Uh, Zachariah Watson, I'm the executive director for Central Vermont. Habitat for Humanity. Um, we're a 501c affordable housing nonprofit. We've uh, been in uh, central Vermont since 1989. Um, and our, I, I was, you know, everybody knows Jimmy Carter, uh, yes, a, a big proponent of Habitat for Humanity. But the biggest um, program that Habitats are known for across the country and the world is our home ownership program. We serve a very specific clientele. Um, we, we work with folks um, that are within 30 to 60 percent of area media. Um, so uh, we basically uh, this parcel that we're looking at this project um, it uh, came to our attention earlier this year as part of a larger proposal um, and um, from behind um, so the lot like I said is um, is forest and currently um, this would be an ideal situation for us to build affordable housing on um, if we can do it uh, so that's the key that's why we're here um, in the application I did include uh, very clearly shows what the issue is that we're dealing with on this parcel uh, is the slope. So red is not good. Uh, red is very steep. Um, and so for us to really make this work, we're going to have to dig into the bank. Um, and uh, excuse me, I should, I should start by saying this is a subdivision and development application. So we are looking to subdivide about 9,000 square feet from uh, 102 to 110 Northfield Street, which is actually two parcels, um, which covers pretty much the entire lot here. Uh, that's all in rural. Uh, this part here is a mixed-use residential. Uh, that's the part we're looking at. Um, and then it's also connected to a second lot, uh, which is residential 9,000. So there's actually three different zones in here. Um, so we're looking to subdivide that, that uh, small, small parcel and build a single family uh, house on it. Um, so as I said, challenges are with the, um, with the 
slope. Mm -hmm. We build some retaining walls back there uh, to uh, to deal with runoff and things like that. Meredith and I have lots of discussions about this uh, to try to sort it out. And we've also run into some other challenges with the ordinance um, in mixed use residential mm -hmm. um, that we are looking at alternative ways of approaching it. Um, we've given you two proposals um, uh, for a single family bedroom, or a single family household, excuse me, it should be in both, uh, both of them should be in your application. The major difference is, is that we, one of them is a shared driveway with the neighbor, 88 Northfield Street, the other is its own driveway. Um, in discussions and a preliminary technical review discussion with the Department of Public Works um, and the fire department and building inspector, uh, got it. Um, it was lovely servants to our community. Um, it was determined that probably having a, our own individual driveway for a lot of reasons is the best route. Um, but of course, I'm here to hear from you all, um, see what questions you have. Um, Meredith, I don't know if you want me to get into the problems or if that's something you'll cover. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think if I think the the subdivision is really what's before you because we'll have a separate discussion about the house design itself and how to go about that with Mike. Um, yeah. Yeah. And 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 that would uh, Meredith may have told you this most likely um, when you do go for const for a construction permit that would be a separate visit back here at which point we would assess the exact yeah. design well, if relative it, to the steep slopes. Yeah. Anything like with the build on the steep slopes, and the, we, we're, we'll discuss how to go about that because I mean there is the option to combine it all into one permit application. Both Sub, the subdivision the and sub the steep slopes. There is a way mm. to you can combine the subdivision and the, and then it's one permit for both. That can be mm. done. Okay. Um, well, we'll leave that to the applicant yep, to decide. Exactly. That's a good. It's fit. a strategy thing, depending on. All the different business dealings and different conditions of different things. Okay. And, and ultimately, I, I think if we if, if we can't build there, we're not going to do the subdivision. And, right. and mm -hmm. it's not really the nature of the site itself would be pretty challenging for anybody to build there. This the plot the the history of this land goes back to you know 1965 when it was a larger parcel that got subdivided so this lot has been in the hands of multiple developers hmm. at least in the last 20 years hmm. and nobody has been able to figure out a use for this despite that it is in a mixed-use residential which um, which has lots of options for developing it uh, it's mm -hmm. meant for infill uh, that's the that's the purpose of mixed-use residential is my understanding mm -hmm. we haven't been able to find a use for it and that's because of the character of the lot um, so we are trying to get creative uh, to to build a house where others have not been able to, and we can do that partly because, as a nonprofit, we have access to grants and um, the way that we our organization is structured, um, mm -hmm. we can take some harder hits than other folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the subdivision that you're proposing is there a structure on the existing lot? So it's kind of tricky. There are two lots. Technically, it's two lots. The, but are you referring to the lot that we want to subdivide? Mm -hmm. Yes. The lot that we would like to subdivide, there is no structures on. Okay. So what would be the plan, short or long term, for the non-developed uh, portion? Uh, the larger portion? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, we are currently working in the city on applying for a uh, community development block planning grant um, for a 50-unit housing development up on that parcel. Um, this is a little bit premature right now because we have no idea if we can build anything up there. Um, it would be a, a carbon negative housing um, community uh, with old growth forest and um, solar panels and, and uh, battery power backup storage and mixed, uh, mixed income housing. So it's, um, it's a larger project. Um, we would, we still need to. Yeah, I should, I should think. <laughs> yes. I mean, like I said, this, the history of this lot, again, in the hands of two developers in the last 20 years, and nobody's been able to figure it out. So as in my discussions with Mike Miller, uh, it's gonna create, it's gonna take some, some finagling to make this a work. good architect I could recommend. Yeah, and <laughs> it, it's, it's good background information. I think we're, um, 
not bound to consider the future use of the oh, other yeah, lot. Or, that, that, so just, yeah, but this is sketch plan review, so yeah, we can yeah, kick so around it, ideas. Okay. I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I just don't want to put you into a corner, like talk about something that's not ready. So, but. Just, so lot one with the proposed home is the 9,000 square feet, lot two being the 56 acres. The subdivision is on the 56 so, so, acres? So here's the thing. Should we Do, put up an image? Is that... Yeah, we can. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I, I can, I can. I mean, Abby can't see it, so I'm not sure how much it helps. But I can give me a second, okay? Okay. Um, because I didn't have it open. Sorry, I'm. Um. The nine thousand square feet is the sub. So, is, is the new safety. parcel to be created? To right. Be created. Is the the nine thousand this this application? Yes. Is about just subdividing those nine thousand square feet that abut Northfield Street. Okay. Okay. The information that I have from Zach that's in this application yeah. talks about this whole thing, the Res 9, the yeah, yeah. rural, yeah. Yeah. and the MUR all is one parcel. I have no evidence that says that they're actually two separate parcels. That's one of the things Zach has to do for me mm -hmm. before we get Correct. to final, is the, where my, is my where is that? Is, right, the, so the, the subdivision is off that 56. Acres. Yes. It's correct. off of Okay, that's yeah, it. That's, that's correct, yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's probably... Are we good without an yeah, image? Shall we proceed? Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to make sure I have it up in case I need it later. All right. <laughs> I got it here, yeah. too. So. Yeah. I've looked at all the land records going back to 1965 and haven't been able to find a, um, the properties adjoining. So I need to learn mm. how that happens naturally. If right. That is the thing. <laughs> um, but that's why I'm assuming everything's two separate lots, technically. Although okay. the last two transactions, they've been sold as one. Mm -hmm. mm, that might have created a merger. I don't know. Right. Depends and on the language. That's why you're the expert. And I'm there, well, there, that's why I prefer people to title attorneys. <laughs> was there? Mm, yeah, I'm not gonna go there. I um, can't. Or I'm whatever. Not. I can't. I can't make an opinion on whether something's merged already or not right. if it's not like, something. What does Title 24 say? But no. Yeah, no, no. no. I'm not. We're not. I, I'm too tired to start digging down there. Yeah, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> All right. So, um, looking at the staff report. It sounds like um, a number a number of the factors about the character of the area are things that are going to need to be presented in some sort of narrative uh, or summary to help us understand those details. It seems like there were two things that kind of jumped out at me, um, one about a height requirement and one about the driveway location. And you've already brought up driveway location. Um, from where I think, the way I think about things is that multiple driveways and curve, curb cuts are less friendly for people w walking and biking because those are extra exit points onto a road that could be a cause for um, vehicular and pedestrian or vehicular and cyclist conflict. So my natural tendency is towards shared accesses, especially um, on that where it's a little blind there um, coming up the hill from town. Um, so. I wonder if, if could you share a little bit more about your conversation with the public works and, and public safety folks as to why they thought it would be is it because it's straight instead of a little curved or uh, so we would need to do a curb cut anyways um, yeah. to expand the shared uh, shared driveway so mm -hmm. there would still need to be some of that anyways um, uh, I think the other challenges would just be about um, talking you know sharing a driveway with a neighbor and mm. all the complications that come along with that okay. Um, uh, we we have not talked to the neighbor about this, so um, uh, if you're watching, don't worry. <laughs> um, so if you're up at 10 o'clock at night watching this, um, but uh, so that's one piece. The other it, that that seemed to be the primary piece was mm -hmm. the complications around uh, just sharing access with a neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, I know for us. It would be more expensive to have a larger car, uh, uh, curb cut, but that's not why. But for us, we're looking at having a separate driveway because that was what the DRB had re recommended. Um, so that, that was not part of the, the okay. consideration. Yeah. Um, I, I would leave it to the neighbors to figure out whether a shared driveway arrangement is convenient or inconvenient. It may be the experience of, of people who work in city government that those things have some challenges, but. I think each circumstance is, is an individual one, and that that's ultimately up to you. That's my feeling about that. But. Yeah, I mean, my sense was that it wasn't because of any DPW standard per se, um, and you know, there there definitely was an openness to discussion about that. Was mm -hmm. my sense from the TRC that um, mm -hmm. you know, in this situation, because it this area, it, this specific area is relatively straight. Mm -hmm. um, that they didn't see sightline issues with either option. Mm -hmm. 
um, and because the neighbor is a single family home and because of the slopes they didn't see either of these parcels being getting a lot of development so it's not like there'd be a ton of traffic here competing with each other so i think they were open to either option at dpw so just yes. having been there at trc yeah. well, i think that the curb cut's not cheap and we're building a house for habitat humanity uh, i would think it's uh... don't forget to be near the microphone so tammy can hear you uh well i don't know curb cuts are not cheap so i would pull you to do whatever is most cost effective Appreciate that, Rob. Um, we are certainly always looking for ways to uh, save money. Uh, that's you know, if we're we're building affordable housing, we we do, we base how much they our homeowners pay based on their income. It has nothing to do with how much we spend. So the, the closer we can actually get the expenses of building to what that person can afford, um, it certainly makes a longevity and the financial strength of our organization last longer. So yes. Did that go to sleep? Because we went back to City of Montpelier. We don't have an image. Right here. Do we, we don't have an image of the room anymore. Uh, no, this is, it's actually been like this before. I think that would be a question of the video camera. Yeah. Uh, Steve. No, not you. You don't know, I don't know what happened to the, we don't have a picture of the room anymore displayed over Zoom. No, no. Huh? I don't know why. Okay. Okay. <laughs> turn it off and turn it on again. <laughs> well, no, don't do it. Don't can't do that. Do that. No, okay. we can't do that. Uh, I mean, technically I could, but. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Not, I'm just going to go. I'm going to look at your computers because okay. I don't think anybody's still watching music. We're going to pause oh, for technical. Uh, sorry. The, um, I'm, no, now it's just looking at me. Um, okay, hold on. That's probably not what it's supposed to do. No, it's <laughs> supposed to somehow tie into that camera. Give me a second. It's a good you take a little pause. It's all right. We've had pretty there. few hiccups with this format uh, so far, so I've been very impressed. Hiccups? Hiccups. Oh, hiccups. Yes, no, it's, it's working fine. It's, yeah. just, it's 10 o'clock. Yeah. Abby, um, thanks, for, thanks for bearing with us. We're fixing some computer stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> only giving me the one camera. Something happened. I, we it, we're, it'll it'll still... It. Can I find one plug there? Oh, there we go. Okay. okay. All right, cool beans Turn it off and turn it back on again. That was me. <laughs> okay, let's... let's <laughs> All right, great. So, um, <clears throat> so driveway location, something we talked about a little. Um, do others have questions about other issues um, that they saw? Any feedback, reflections? I, I'm just kind of curious. There's a, I think there's a minimum height requirement of 24 feet in this district, and I read in the report that that can't be met, and I'm wondering why. Well, so it's partly, partly because of the character of the lot. It's also partly because of restrictions we have in, in um, the way that we build our housing. Um, so uh, the 24-foot height requirement is based on the average grade of the property, which due to this, the slope of the property increases the grade. So instead of a 24-foot minimum, for us it's a 29-foot minimum. That hmm. means we need to build a three-story house. Um, and typically we're building for four, uh, three bedrooms, one and a half bath. Uh, for us to build a three-story affordable housing house with three bedrooms and one and a half bath would be pretty unfeasible for a number. Mm -hmm. It would be pretty, well, it would, we could do it. It would be really narrow and really tall. It would look very silly. It would um, be a duplex. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Uh, we looked at a duplex. A yeah. duplex is not feasible in this spot, mostly mm -hmm. because we like to provide a shed. Mm -hmm. um, so that our homeowners have a place to store their things, a, lot, um, a lawn, uh, so that their kids can play in the yards, and we also provide parking. Um, so mm -hmm. the two challenges for Habitat for Humanity are our costs. Mm -hmm. um, so one choice is that we could put the garage underneath it. Um, garages typically cost about $30,000. Our houses by themselves without a garage cost $150,000 to build. So $30,000 is pretty extensive um, when we're looking at trying to keep it affordable. Um, the other part is we use volunteers to build our houses. That's how we keep them affordable. Um, Jimmy Carter. Uh, so having volunteers on the roof of a three-story house is not safe. And our architects and our builders do not feel comfortable with it. Um, that these two reasons are, are the main reason why we probably would not qualify for a variance from the 24-foot minimum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, because that is our discretion. Mm -hmm. So, it, um, 
that's okay. the challenge with that. Like, Thank you. Do you have to go 5% or is that? That won't get you there. Oh, we've, yes. trust me, we've worked those. Um, okay. Do you want to hear about how we're looking at solving this with Mike Miller or not? I think we'll let you work on it okay. some more. Yeah. Thank you. For the purposes like of. just called him Mick Miller, too. Did I say Mick? <laughs> I'm, my, I'm so tired. Um, I, did a, I did a whole separate meeting with hearings before this started did, at 7. She did. <laughs> no, I appreciate you all very much. And this well, is a complicated one. Uh, mm -hmm. Meredith and I were reading through all three different zoning ordinances to figure this one out. Wow. And, uh, and really getting into the weeds about it. And, mm -hmm. and it's been a challenge. So, yeah, we're looking at um, other, you know, I, I don't know exactly where we go from here. Um, okay. That's kind of where we're at. Uh, okay. Since we are looking at this larger parcel, there might be potential for rezoning the entire thing, mm -hmm. which could increase our density and allow for make this a lot more cost effective for us. Mm -hmm. um, if we rezoned a residential 9,000, also if we did that, um, we would apply for a variance, um, and the variance would apply in the circumstance because there's a requirement for a 20-foot setback. And this okay. property is in Lower. Wow. So what that means is we're going to build the house there. Mm -hmm. It just means that we have to go through a rezoning and a variance to build the house there as opposed to just building it because we know we're going to build it anyways. Um, so kind of back to our original consideration with what we do with a, with a sketch plan review. We, I think, are looking at this as a board and saying, yep, you could put a lot there and one could build a house there. It is a developable lot as proposed. Mm -hmm whether it's developable in the manner you need to develop right. is a separate question from what we determined. So um, good to know the background, but I, I feel pretty comfortable with the nature of this lot. My, and I've said my piece about the driveway. Any other questions or concerns about it? Uh, Habitat owns the whole parcel. We do not. Parcel. No. No, we have a purchase option on the parcel. Okay. Great. It goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if there are no other questions from board members, um, I'll pause so that Abby can chime in if she chooses. Okay. okay. Thanks, Abby. All right. In that case, thank you for waiting um, to present this evening. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you all. And thanks for your work. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. And I got a, uh, well, actually, we have an AmeriCorps crew joining us on our house in Barrie right now. It's exciting. And they're all from Georgia and California, so we got to get them some goodies for Vermont. There you go. Break it in, yeah. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, folks. Other businesses that our next meeting is scheduled for July 19th if there are continuations from this evening of, and there are not any so um, if the next meeting date will be August 16th with that I would accept a motion to adjourn into deliberative session so moved is there a second second I'll call, I'll call the roll Kevin yes Jean yes Rob yes Abby yes and I vote yes we are adjourned to deliberative session thank you Abby stay on we're just gonna bump okay. everybody else off, and because I I don't I don't okay. want to try and send you an email with a link or anything like that. 